My name is Lara. I am the community manager at European Leadership University. We have, of course, a full program both today and tomorrow uh, with over uh, 14 speakers. We have 200 participants. So we're really excited that you're uh, spending some of your time with us today. Uh, you should, of course, feel free to kind of uh, tune in for as long uh, or as uh, many sessions as you like, or you can just have us on the background and listen in. Um, but uh, again, thank you so much for joining. If you have any questions or any comments that come up, we really would love to see some interaction from you. So you can use either the chat down below or the Q&A to ask your questions. We have asked all the speakers to leave a few minutes of their time for questions from the audience. Um, but we'll see if we can, can if we can go over all of them. Uh, if not, we'll do our best to answer through the chat as well. So thank you again. And I will leave it to our host for today. Priscilla. Hi, thank you, Laura, and welcome everyone to our uh, summit. Very excited to be your host today. My name is Christella. I'm Employer Relationship Lead at European Leadership University and a tech and data science recruiter. Um, I just want to pass the word really quickly back to Laura to tell a little bit about ourselves and the community we have at the European Leadership University, as that has been uh, one of the reasons to host this summit. Uh, and after that, I'll tell you all about the program that we're diving into today. Uh, Laura, can you tell us a little bit about uh, European Leadership University and the community that we have? Absolutely. So uh, my role as a community manager at European Leadership University is, as you can guess, to kind of coordinate and to grow our community, our community of students, of faculty, and also other partners uh, and people in our network. Now, we are a next generation university offering online, flexible uh, and practical uh, degree programs exclusively in tech. So we started out with our flagship program in data science and master's degree. Uh, and now we're also launching several uh, other programs, including in software engineering, DevOps, AI. Um, so do, make, do take a look if you're considering maybe starting a, a program on our website. Uh, we'll also be talking uh, later on with our founder and a student at the university too. So there's plenty of space during the program to learn more about us. But in short, um, since we're focusing very much on the skills of tech degrees, we wanted to organize a summit that is uh, available to a wider public. Uh, and that's why we're doing this together with AI just today. Thank you, Lara. Yes, so what is today all about? We'll dive deep into the subject of data science and what it is to choose a career in data science. Um, I'm guessing that most of you who are here know a bit about uh, the data science industry and what is happening there. Um, we're all gathering more and more information about people, about events, about locations, everything, and that is all used deep in, in business of data science. And Sorry. Um, and um, it is used in, in more and more ways. You know it on Netflix, you notice it on Facebook, but you also see it in choosing your insurances and literally everywhere. Um, and we want to uh, tell you more about what it is to become a data scientist yourself. So how can you work with all this information to, for example, predict what is going to happen within a company or within uh, a municipality could be as well. Um, we'll talk to many experts today. We'll talk to people who are working as a data consultant. We'll talk to uh, recruiters. We'll talk to entrepreneurs uh, from uh, all different areas from all over the world. So uh, very welcome. And like Lara said, please put all your questions uh, that you have in the chat and we'll definitely make sure that uh, uh, you get most of them answered. Um, so for the first uh, introductionary uh, meeting that we have, uh, I would like to introduce to you Robert and Alper who have been uh, uh, also organizing this summit for you. Um, uh, Robert, perhaps you could start uh, with introducing yourself and AI Gents. Of course, thank you, Christella. My name is uh, Robert, indeed. I'm founder of AI Gents and uh, co-organizer of this event. Uh, AI Agents is a career community for data scientists and machine learning engineers. It's a place where you can find internships, traineeships, and jobs as well, mainly in the Netherlands, uh, by the way. It's also a place where you can take free skill tests, uh, you can discover events and, and, and training courses. Uh, 
Um, it's also a network of communities where you can exchange ideas uh, with other people, where you can find coding tutorials, career tips, case studies, uh, long reads, uh, etc. So if you want to know more about AIGENS, just uh, have a look at AIGENS.com. Thank you. And also joining us for this uh, first introduction is uh, Alper, who's the founder of European Leadership University. Alper, welcome. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, so um, I'm leading European Leadership University. We are a, a next generation university focusing on the skills uh, gap, primarily in Europe and at the global scale with the tech degrees and um, skills and credentials jobs bundled as, a, as an offer for aspiring uh, young tech professionals. So data science is, uh, is a very important topic for us. We'll talk about it. And I'm very excited to be here as European Leadership University, which is, you know, one of our ways this summit is creating a community of data scientists. And I would like to say hello to our 250 participants from four continents, 60 countries. So it's wonderful to see people from South Africa to Indonesia, to Colombia, to US, to Netherlands, and so many more. So uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. And to hear more about us, uh, you can go to www.elu.nl to hear and know more about European Leadership University. Thank you, Alper. Um, and my question for you is actually, why, um, why did you start European Leadership University and why choose data science as a program? Why did you choose to, to set that up? The uh, first question is, is very important. One of the things we've noticed that there is a mismatch in the job market. What, what do I mean with that? There are lots of young professionals graduating from universities and they are either underemployed or unemployed or they don't have freedom of choice for what they would like to do. This uh, rate of underemployment and un unemployment together um, goes above 50% in certain countries like Southern Europe, US, which means that you study business administration and then you work in a job that doesn't require that degree. So we said, is there a way um, to kind of uh, support that? And on the other side, when we asked that question, we, we've been working with corporations and there are lots of progressive, innovative corporations who want to grow. And they have, you know, all these new emerging tech roles coming up and they cannot fi find the people that they need. So on one side, companies cannot find the people they are looking for and the people cannot find the jobs they are going after. So is there a way to create European Leadership University to do that? And we've uh, created all our programs based on the job market, based on the need in partnership with the employers. And data science is uh, an important starting point for us because um, I think that is the new uh, manager's role. We will we'll talk more about this, but you know, in, in the industrial revolution, we had workers and we had managers, but now the most of the work that we used to do are being done by the code, by the machine. And uh, we need people who can manage that code, that data, and data scientists are the new manager and a data science program like the masters we're offering is the new MBA. And we wanted to offer this new opportunity to give the freedom of choice to young professionals for, the, for their future. And, um, and this is a field, it's growing so fast. So, and we can see it from the response that we've had in a, such a short time. So, and yeah, I think, uh, that is uh, one of the reasons uh, that we wanted to create the data science program, the main reason. Great, thank you. And what about you, Robert? I think you have the largest uh, data science and AI community within uh, the Netherlands uh, for sure. Um, can you tell me how you uh, got to know the field of data science and uh, why you started a community in this field? Well, uh, Christella, that's actually a long story. I don't have a background in data science myself. Um, in 2015, I accidentally started uh, some communities in the field of data science and AI. I did this on, on Meetup and on LinkedIn. Why I did this is a long story. I was working on an assignment for a large retailer and it had something to do with like 
predicting a shopping list and I need some expert advice how we could use machine learning for this. And at that moment, I didn't knew anyone in my network. So I thought, hey, let's start a meetup group and I can discuss this case with a few people at my home, I thought. But then at a, at a certain moment, more than 100 people um, wanted to attend this event. So what happened that evening, I, I organized a meetup, but we didn't talk about predicting shopping lists at all. But like a, a machine learning community was born. And um, well, these groups on Meetup and LinkedIn, they uh, were growing. And at a certain moment, companies start approaching me and they ask me, hey, can we share some jobs to your, uh, with your communities? Well, of course I never did this. But then I thought, hey, why don't I build, uh, why yeah, do I not build a platform um, where people can find jobs, events, training courses, and all content related to data science in one place. Well, actually, that's where it started um, and how I founded AI Gents, actually. And, and, and why do you think it's important to create a community in this tech field? It might feel like uh, a field that is all about learning coding um, uh, and being strong in, on the technical or the mathematical side, but why is it important to create a community amongst people? Well, I think it has a lot of benefits. Of course, you meet new people, you learn new things, you might get opportunities which you would have missed if you were not part of the community. Uh, it keeps, keeps you up to date with all things that are going, ar going around in, in your field of expertise. So, and last but uh, not least, it had a lot of, it's a lot of fun, of course. So I would definitely recommend anyone to, to, to join any community related to their career. Uh, maybe I can add something here, Christella, uh, uh, from a learning perspective. Um, one of the also uh, challenges in, in, in learning that we face in tech communities is learning is always regarded as something individual and cognitive. But I think uh, we know that the best learning happens in social settings. So learning is social, learning is experiential. And, and data science has grown so much, becoming become a community of practice. And, and this is a great opportunity to learn from the community and in such events and other online and offline communities. So, you know, what you're doing, Robert, is, is a great service uh, to the community of practice in data science, which enables uh, thousands of people uh, to interact and learn from each other. So that's, for me, the most exciting part of learning, to be honest. Christella. Great, I couldn't agree more. Um, Alper, can I ask you something? Why, why do you think that that um, uh, data science is becoming increasingly important. You just said that it's important for, for managerial roles, but do you think it's something that's important for, for everyone to learn about or just for the experts? Well, uh, that's a wonderful question. I, uh, I will tell you, I, I want to tell you what I tell to the students in our master's program. Data, in my perspective, a data scientist title will disappear in the next five years. So it's like they were, oh, when I say this, they say, why are we studying it? Well, it will disappear, but every role in every organization will have the data scientist capability and role embedded. So a finance manager will need to be a data scientist. A marketing director will need to be a data scientist. So that is, a kind of a, a norm standard skill for the future. So this is why it is so important. And one of the biggest fads we hear, you know, are we going to lose our jobs to robots? I don't think so, but we will lose our ro uh, jobs to people who can speak to robots, who can speak to machines. So data scientists and machine learning engineers, which is, you know, one step further from that, are the people who will steal the jobs, which is not the intention that we have when we do that, but this is, uh, this is the case. So this is also why it's important. It is the, it's, it's the mainstream job of the future or even today. And also it is uh, going to be defined the standards of the next generation jobs. 
So this is why it's important. And of course, we know data is the new oil and you know everything goes around data. There are lots of things going that, yes, that's important. We have the blockchain revolution coming in our, uh, you know, in our near future and data scientists will be at the abreast of that revolution. That's another story. But I think we don't have to go all the way that, that far. Um, just, I think for me, it's enough to know that it is the next mainstream job. And actually, we have a wonderful question that, that follows on this, Albert. Thank you. Um, which is, uh, um, and, and thank you for the question as well. Can a person with neither mathematics nor computer science background learn data science and do a job in it? And if yes, what, what step to take? What to learn? Okay. I think uh, math is, uh, is, is, a, is a very important foundation to become a data scientist. So you need to be good in math. You need to like math. I have to tell you that. If you, know, if you don't like math, then, and, but like data, there are other data roles that you can do, like being a data translator or a data engineer or a data analyst. So that is, math is important. The computer science background, Oh, that's important, but not uh, for me, it's not a must for data to be a data scientist. It's very helpful, for example, to become a machine learning engineer, um, but you can become a data scientist with um, good uh, math uh, background and courage to learn you know, coding like Python, which is actually for me the next Excel in a way. We have to take it like that. Uh, so that's also going to be standard. And so, yeah, with, with math and the courage to learn tech, uh, I think you can become a data scientist. Thank you. Yeah, I also really think it depends on, uh, like you don't have to become the absolute expert, right? Um, it's also really important that there's people who can be the, the, the bridge between the business and the data who can speak the language of, of both sides, but are not necessarily uh, mathematical experts or, or, or coding experts themselves. Um, so I think you can already take some steps to integrate data in your own job, right? And in your own life without becoming like the absolute experts. But I do agree, some math is great. <laughs> yes, I think, yeah, I think there's a great need also to be for data translators as McKinsey coined this term or business translators. And that's also a very valuable role. If you do, do not like to dive into math and, uh, or coding that much, but stay in between data and business, yes, this is also a wonderful opportunity. Yes. Okay, one last question. So I would like to ask uh, uh, Robert, which is what are you uh, expecting from the summit today and tomorrow from the next two days and what do you hope to, to learn and to find? Well, I think this event will be helpful both for the people who are considering studying data science, but also for more seasoned uh, data scientists. So what you can expect are insights, tips, or recommendations um, for, for, well, well, for when are you considering studying data science. It can be helpful to improve certain skills like how to write a good resume, how to improve your interview skills along with other tips and tricks that will help you to, to kickstart or to, to boost your career. All right, thank you. Uh, Robert will actually be hosting the second day of our summit, which is uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, so you'll definitely see him again. Um, uh, for now, I would like to thank Robert and Alper for, for being here uh, as we move along to uh, the next part of our, um, of our summit. So thank you. You Thank you, Christella. Thank you, Christella. Uh, great to be here. Um, and um, I already see a lot of questions coming up in the chat and in the Q&A, which is great. We're, we're definitely going to collect them all. Uh, my colleague Lara will, uh, will collect them all. And some of them will come back in the program, actually. So we'll talk a lot more about how to get started studying. We have someone who's going to talk about the different learning institutes and which one to uh, choose and what is a good starting point for, for you as a professional, depending on your background. We'll talk to a recruiter in tech who is an expert in this field and who can tell you all about um, how to make the transfer to a job and actually tomorrow is much more about landing the job as well 
Um, so please uh, feel free to take a look at the whole program to see which time slots are interesting for you. Or of course, stay here the whole time with us. We're really happy to have you. Um, uh, Lara will post the program into the chat once more so you can uh, check it out there um, and make sure that you're here on time for the uh, slot that interests you most. Um, so keep sending us your question and we're definitely collecting them all. Um, so this was our introduction. We'll move on to the uh, second part with our first guest speakers. Uh, very happy to, to have them. We're gonna talk about who is who in the data science team? There's so many different roles that you might have heard of, um, and it can sometimes be confusing who does what in a team. So we're gonna talk about that with two experts who are both uh, a data science consultants, um, and they'll introduce themselves a bit more. But first of all, I would like to welcome you, Henriette and Viviana. Please turn on your camera and your uh, mic. Yes, hi. Hi. Welcome um, and thank you for being here. Um, could you perhaps start with uh, with an introduction of, uh, of who you are and then I'll give the floor to you. We'll do some questions at the end if that's okay for you. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, I'm Viviane Haring. Um, I'm working as a data science consultant at Amsterdam Data Collective. Um, Amsterdam Data Collective is a small consultancy firm uh, focusing on data science. And we work mainly in the financial sector, uh, public sector, and also the healthcare sector. Um, well, we, we have uh, now around 30 consultants, uh, but we are like fast growing. Um, yeah, maybe Henriette, you will also introduce yourself. Yes, I will also introduce myself shortly. Uh, so my name is Henriette Klaus. Uh, I uh, have studied econometrics in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and I have been working at Amsterdam Data Collective for two years. And I will, yeah, so I will be doing the second talk and Viviana will do the first talk. So I will give a, a word back to Viviana. Yeah, um, so I will share my screen. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about uh, who is who in the team, understanding the titles. And uh, well, we did already uh, our introduction. So we're going to talk about uh, which type of roles they are, the type of employers, um, the titles within, this, uh, within the employers, and also um, a bit about the salary you are, you're, you're going to earn if you uh, become a data scientist or uh, one of the other roles. Um, but first, I have a question to you. What type of roles do you think uh, of within data science? And uh, maybe you can uh, put your answers in the chat. Let me see if I can uh, open them. Okay, so I see a uh, data analyst, data engineer, data manager, machine learning engineer, uh, data scientist, of course, data consultant, data miner. Um, yeah, a lot of different roles. And I also think there are a lot of uh, names for the same roles. So, um, or they come in for more product owner, BI developer. Yeah. So as you can see, you already know that there are a lot of different roles within data science. And uh, yeah, also a lot of roles uh, have different names within different companies. So also the roles that I'm going to present are not like the uh, how it is like worldwide, but it is, uh, I want to give you a bit more insight, like what they mean and how to plot them uh, in the data science world. So first, um, let's start 10 years ago. Uh, data science was upcoming. It was quite small compared to how it is now. And you actually had one role, which was the data scientist. And the data scientist um, worked actually in different kind of fields and also had a lot of skills. So the data scientists talked to the business to see what they wanted and um, which data was needed. They talk to the, uh, or they uh, create a data set, they check the data quality. Um, 
determined on which environment they wanted to program. They also did the analytics, so made models or made algorithms, and then also uh, came back to the business to explain what their models did and how to use them and what kind of insights the business could get from it. So actually it was a very, um, it was a job with a lot of variety, I would say. Uh, and you, it was really like the end-to-end -end data science. But now in the last couple of years, uh, as data science is growing and growing, you see that uh, the data science pipeline is actually cut up in different pieces. And um, you see that, uh, that, that also, um, you see that it happens more and more. So that's also with the wide, wide um, like data science application is growing, data is growing. Um, so more and more roles appear. She also saw in the in the chat. Um, so to plot these roles a little bit, we made this picture, um, and you see that uh, especially at the bigger companies, there you you are a data engineer or you are a data scientist, and not both anymore. And there are even whole teams of data engineers and whole teams of data scientists. Um, and one example, I uh, read a blog of a picnic a couple of days ago. The picnic is the online uh, supermarket, which is growing really fast. And they have a team of nine data engineers, a uh, team of 10 data scientists, and they have uh, 150 uh, analyst, analyst, analysts in uh, working on the data. And those nine data engineers are making sure that the data is loaded daily, um, that the quality is correct, that the right people have the right access. So it's really, if you then working as a data engineer, you're really focusing on the data and not um, on the analytics anymore. Um, and I think if you work uh, at smaller companies, it's a bit different because then there's most of the time only one or two uh, data scientists. And then it also means that you have more uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, pipeline that you have to manage as a data scientist. So then you will uh, be creating data sets, um, checking data quality, doing the analytics on the data, and also talk to the management to uh, see like what you did, if that is helpful for them, um, and to give them some more insights from the data. So you see really a shift from being a data scientist to more specific roles. Um, well, to explain a bit more about these roles, um, a data engineer is the one that really focuses on um, the data architecture actually the data architect designs how the data should be uh, should be saved in the different systems and what the structure should be but the data engineer does the technical uh, thing by building this whole data warehouse or data lake and they also make sure that the data quality is uh, is good and that the right people have the right access to this uh, data well the data architect um, is actually linked between the business and the data engineer and he or she designs the whole, um, yeah, the whole systems and how it should look, uh, where the data should be and how it should be linked to each other. Uh, and also if the business wants, for example, more data, then um, they will uh, ask, well, they will tell to the data architect and um, yeah, he will talk to the data, he will implement that in his data architecture. Then the data strategist, is really uh, business focus, focused and he or she determines like what should be the strategy. So what uh, do we want from the data actually that is uh, in the company? And also, for example, like maybe they want something, uh, but it's not possible with the current data. So then they can request mo more data. Um, the, data, the analytics translator is actually the link between the business and the analysts. So they uh, translate the, um, the models or the outcomes of the models to the business and explains what it means for the business. So it gives the business the insights they need and also um, make the models more explainable so that they also the business understands how they, uh, how they came to this answer. And then you also have the business analytics, analytics analysts who, um, do like basic an, uh, analytics on the on the data. So, for example, looking at trends, um, they 
should know the data really well uh, and they can answer most of the questions the business has, for example, uh, about the data. And then uh, last but not least, you, have, you also have the data scientist, which is a link between the technical uh, side and the analytical side. And they do a more in-depth analysis of the data and really building models to, for example, predict uh, things about the data. So that's a bit, um, yeah, the different roles. Uh, that are available, or uh, where you can work in if you uh, if you like to work with data. Um, and I think for myself, for example, I mostly uh, work in the field of data engineering and data science, um, and also a little bit uh, like translating the the models that I build to the business so that they can use them uh, in the end. Well, then about the type of uh, employers. Um, well, you have different type, of course. You have uh, corporates to start with. Um, you have big corporates like big banks, for example, or other big companies. And you have also small corporates. Well, as I said before, I, I noticed that in large companies, uh, the data science pipeline is really cut into pieces and that you really work on one part of the pipeline. While with small companies, you, um, you work like more to end-to-end -end data science uh, solution. Um, you have a consultancy where you also have the large consultancy firms like the Big Four and the um, McKinsey, for example, and you also have smaller consultancy firms like, for example, Amsterdam Data Collective, where I work for. Um, I think it really depends on the type of projects, like if you uh, work in a specific role or if you do end-to-end -end data science, so if, you, if your consultancy firm mainly has like smaller projects, then you will do end-to-end -end and otherwise you will focus more on one uh, part of the data science chain. Um, yeah, with contracting, uh, you will be uh, working on your own. And I think uh, especially when you start, it's quite uh, difficult because you do not have the experience yet. You don't have the context, but I can imagine that when you uh, have more experience and you work longer that it can be beneficial especially of course with the salary because that will be a lot higher when you uh, work on your own and then last but not least you also have startups where you can uh, work uh, and I think yeah startups are quite nice because they are often in innovative and um, you really build something but I think uh, especially when you start the disadvantages that you're most of the time the only data scientist in that company and that means that you uh, well you have a lot of freedom to do what you want of course but you don't have more senior data scientists where you can learn from but that can be a, a, a disadvantage um, if we then look at the different type of uh, yeah titles you have within the company you have the uh, first the intern or the working student then you have uh, like the analyst. So most of the time when you come from, uh, you're done with your study, you will start as an analyst within uh, a company or a corporate. Um, well, then after a few years, you can grow to manager. Um, and then a couple of years later, you can be head of some department, for example, or director, and then you can even uh, get more promotion. And of course, when you, uh, uh, Climb this ladder, ladder, you will also get more responsibilities for each role you, uh, you get. Then you also have uh, for consultancy a bit of different roles. Most of the time you start as a junior consultant or analyst or associate. And then after one or two years, you will become a consultant. So, for example, data science consultant. Um, then after a few years later, you can become a senior consultant or senior associate if you want. Um, and then you can become a manager, a senior manager. Uh, and for example, you can also become head of a financial sector. So really grow into one specific domain and get a lot of experience in uh, there. And in the end, you can also become like a managing director or a partner. Um, then also uh, sell something about uh, salary. So I have another question to you. What do you think you will earn in the USA on average as a junior data scientist? Uh, 
data scientist, as a data science manager or data science director. And I have to say, it's a, you can answer in dollars and uh, USA does pay a lot more than the, it is in the Netherlands. So first answer I see already, uh, 120, uh, between 120 and $150, yeah, more than $100,000. Let's see what other people think. Between sixty thousand and one hundred thousand dollars, seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars for junior. Yeah, okay. I think I think uh, you're close. So I found this uh, picture online, um, and it shows that like a junior data scientist in America earns around ninety-one thousand dollars. And then when you become a data scientist, you already earn $108,000 a year. So then you already grow real, really fast. And it continues to grow a lot, I think, when you become more senior and uh, get more knowledge. Of course, it's the USA, so it's not, uh, not completely comparable with, uh, with Europe and especially with the Netherlands. But I think like the trend is actually a bit similar. So you can earn, of course, a lot of money when you become a data scientist with a lot of experience. And I also have a picture to compare the different roles. And it's also interesting to see, I think, that um, this is also in the USA, and that a data scientist yeah, earns uh, the most money, even more than uh, like a business intelligence manager. Um, and uh, after that, also interesting to see is that the data architects earn more money than the data engineer in the USA. And I think uh, the reason for that is that the data, data architect really um, uh, yeah, creates the, the way the data is, uh, um, is saved. Like um, it, it really develops it and, uh, or not develop it, but draws it and the data engineer should develop it. And I think there are a lot more data engineers working than a data architect. So for example, you only need one data architect to build something uh, and you need a lot of data engineers. So I think it's uh, like a, the, the profession is more rare, uh, but I'm curious how that is going to develop in the next couple of years. Um, and then last but not least, one uh, also a picture of uh, different companies. Um, and then you see uh, that, well, in the US you earn like $96,000, uh, it says here. But in Germany, it's around sixty thousand dollars, and I think that's more comparable with uh, with the Netherlands. So it's not what you're going to earn when you start as a data scientist, but I think uh, after like five years or something, you can earn uh, something around uh, this. So that's uh, actually quite nice. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you for your attention. Do you have uh, any questions? Thank you, Vivian. We did actually get some uh, uh, some questions from the uh, from the audience, which is okay. great. I think it was very insightful. People were um, asking about the, the numbers in the EU, but I think you reflected on that a little bit. Um, yeah. um, something about that salary was the question: if it's if you can earn that salary remote, you think, or is this all a, like pre-COVID on the job positions? Do you know? Yeah, so the, the pictures of the figures I found were indeed pre-COVID, but I think, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't know why you cannot earn it remote, right? I think um, that the whole, there's a whole new way of working, and I hope and think that in the future you can also work uh, for an American company from the Netherlands. So it would be nice if you then, of course, can earn the same uh, salary. But yeah, I think we have to see how that uh, develops. Yeah, it's still all a bit unsure, obviously. It yeah. Um, so other people are asking about the roles that you described. Uh, one was, is it a good idea at this point to start uh, with data engineering and move into data science or, um, or just go for data science straight away? What, what would you advise? I would say start with what you like most. So if you like most to like um, do more of the data engineering stuff, so building data sets, doing data quality checks, start with that but if you enjoy like analyzing data more and getting useful insights from that 
um, start there. And my experience is also that you can switch quite easily also between departments and also between teams within a company. So if you start as a data engineer and you think about uh, after a few years from oh, I would like to know more about data science, it's even it's easy to switch because it's uh, yeah, it's not the same uh, role, of course, but it's really comparable. So you already have like the technical skills and it's, I think, quite easy to uh, to then also do data science work. Right. And and does that also apply to someone who is a business analyst and would switch to data science? You think that's another question that is that uh, Keen is asking. Thank you. Yeah. OK, I think that transition is maybe a bit harder, but not impossible, I would say. Um, so I think you then lack a bit of the technical uh, um, um, skills like, uh, yeah, like more the statistics or the modeling stuff. But I think it will still be possible, but maybe then you should follow some courses or do a bit of, uh, yeah, uh, what do you say, the reschooling? Mm, upskilling, yeah. Upskilling, yeah, yeah. But maybe like if you, ha if you have really interested in it and you think you can do it, you can, of course, with your employee, uh, like talk about it and maybe they say, yeah, we will learn you. And then if you, you can be uh, quite advanced, quite fast, I think. Yeah. yeah, and I do think more and more companies will invest in their people to, to move more to, to uh, data science jobs or data engineering jobs because it's important for them. Yeah, I think so too. I hope this answered the question that we, uh, that we got from our audience um, uh, and everyone is uh, well, um, they're saying thanks to you um, and to the information that you've given. So thank you, Vivienne. I um, understood that your colleague, uh, Henriette, will do the, the second part um, where we'll talk more about the uh, skills. So uh, what should you learn as a, um, as a data professional? Um, so thanks again, Vivienne. Um, maybe yes. if people have more questions, they can um, uh, ask them to you in the chat or you can answer them. Um, and then I'll give the floor to uh, Henriette. Yes, thank you, Vivian, for the nice talk. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, I'm happy to be talking to you about uh, coding languages and tools. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself quickly and, uh, and Amsterdam Data Collective. Uh, I already did it a bit, but uh, maybe you're only tuning in now. Uh, so my name is Harriet Klaus, I studied econometrics in Rotterdam and I started two years ago at Amsterdam Data Collective and I'm currently living in London. Um, and uh, Amsterdam Data Collective, a bit more about that. So we are a small consultancy company based in Netherlands. Uh, our data science projects are divided through three sectors, uh, finance, public and healthcare. Uh, it's a very fast growing company. So I started uh, two years ago uh, and then we were with 12 people and uh, currently we're uh, with 35. So we're growing very fast. And I think, yeah, that's also a bit representative for the whole sector because it's growing very fast. So I think that's very exciting to be working in, in this field. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, to you about, uh, for about 20 minutes uh, about coding language and, and tools, which ones to learn. Uh, we have three elements. So first, uh, I'll be talking uh, about, or I'll show you a video, uh, a short walk for history. Uh, then I will give you an overview of the current tools, which are there. And I also reflect a bit back on the talk of Vienna. And then I will close uh, with uh, some future trends. But first, I would like to ask you a question. Um, so what do you think that the technical skills are that you need to learn uh, to work as a data scientist? Um, you can state your answer in the chat uh, and then I will, um, I will see if I, uh, we touch upon them. Uh, let me see if I can see the chat. Yes, so I see Python, SQL, um, and uh, R, statistical coding, machine learning, Sounds very good. Um, and I will see uh, whether there are also tools uh, which we won't mention in the talk. So let's go to the next thing. Um, here I have a, a small video. Uh, it's actually a short walk for history of the, uh, the coding languages, which were popular in which times. 
So here you can see the popularity measured um, by how many people ask questions on Stack Overflow. Um, and you see that C Sharp was the most popular language uh, when this video started, so in 2008, and now we're in Henry, sorry, just breaking in. We can't see your screen if that's what you're trying to... Uh... Oh, <laughs> then it's not good. <laughs> I will uh, go back. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so let's uh, do it again. Uh, here you see the popularity uh, of the different languages measured uh, on Stack Overflow. So you see that uh, C Sharp is the most popular language uh, when this video began in 2008. And uh, you see that Java is the second popular language. And uh, you see that Python is uh, coming up in the red bar. And also SQL is um, growing a bit over time. But you see that uh, Java and JavaScript uh, together with C Sharp are uh, the most popular languages. I think we're now around 2012. Uh, and then you see that uh, Python is coming up um, and growing uh, yeah, popularity. And you see also that there are new languages like Ruby, uh, R, um, and uh, they, those are yeah, not gaining popularity very fast. Here we see Swift entering, uh, which is also gaining popularity. And then we see so we're now in 2016 and still JavaScript, Java, those are the most popular languages. But then we see actually it's something very interesting that Python is gaining popularity uh, very fast. Uh, so it is growing. And you see also that, for example, R and Swift are getting more popular. And this is then the end state. So we see that, uh, so this video stops unfortunately two years ago, uh, but um, Python is, I think you could say that it's one of the most popular languages uh, now. So then we'll go to an overview of the current tools. Uh, I got the chart from Vienna, uh, which explains the different roles. And then I will go through these and, and uh, explain which tools you could use. Uh, for each of these roles. Um, something to say in advance uh, is that uh, each company uses different tools. So it really also depends on which company you are working in, but I will explain the most popular. Let's start with analytics translation. Uh, so this is, these are some tools to visualize the data. So we have Power BI and Tableau, and those are uh, tools that are, for example, used in banks. Uh, to visualize the data, to make dashboards. And I also put Excel there. I didn't really dare to actually, but I, I had to do it because many companies are still working on with Excel, um, especially uh, some older companies um, with people who've been working there for 30 years and, and are really used to those tools. Um, so Excel is actually still quite a popular uh, tool to visualize data. And I would say that it's very handy to be very good in it, although I know there are way better tools to visualize data sometimes, but it can be easy uh, to show people because they know the tool. Uh, then we go to business analytics and there I'm going more to the interactive dashboard. So I include it next to uh, Power BI and Tableau, also Python Dash and R Shiny. Of course, those are um, linked to Python and R um, and you can make interactive dashboards with that. Then I'm going more to the data science, and I think that is also what uh, was most mentioned in the in the chat. Uh, we have Python, R, MATLAB, and again Excel because uh, it's still being used as a data science tool. Uh, R is actually a very pro a popular uh, language for uh, medical research. Uh, MATLAB is, for example, used in um, many banks, and Python. I think it's used in uh, uh, more the startup companies that um, uh, more fast growing companies because it's all open source. So for example, banks are a bit more hesitant to the use of R of Python. So and they use MATLAB because it's more safe. Uh, they think it's more safe. Um, and yeah, 
And then we go to the data engineering. And I must say that I am a bit more on the right side myself, but I asked some colleagues which are very good on the left side. So we have uh, SQL. Uh, SQL, um, yeah, it's a very popular tool. And I think you could even put it in different, different buckets here. Um, Hadoop is a very popular tool for data storages and processing uh, large amounts of data. Uh, Spark the same. Docker is an is uh, for app developers, uh, and I will touch upon that app later or the tool later. Uh, then we have Django. Django is a high level Python web framework. Uh, it's very clean and it has a pragmatic design, uh, and its primary goal is to ease the creation of of the very complex uh, database driven websites. Um, so yeah, it's it's actually designed to make things more easy. And then we have a Laravel framework uh, that's a custom uh, software development tool, and that's for example very uh, popular for integration with uh, mail services. So you can easily make uh, automized automized emails uh, to several persons. And then we have Vue. Uh, Vue is a tool uh, which is very good for building websites. But I, again, these are just some some of the tools that you could use, and there are way more, I, uh, I'm sure. Uh, then we go to data architecture. I also included SQL there because, uh, yeah, I think it's very commonly used there. Uh, also Java uh, for yeah to develop uh, desktop applications, mobile applications. Uh, Knime. Knime is, or I'm not sure if I'm even speaking it correctly, pronouncing it correctly, but it's it's a very um, modular data pipelining concept. So it's very modular in the setup, uh, which is very good for agile way of working, um, and it's also good for uh, use for machine learning uh, much. And then we have the Power Designer. I think Power Designer is a very good tool for data architecture because it's used to visualize. Uh, your databases so you can really easy make data lineages so what how does the data flow from part e to part b to part c uh, and there i think power designer is very nice uh, and lastly azure uh, azure is a microsoft uh, cloud computing service um, and uh, it's based on c sharp for analytics and, and data storage and I think um, also Azure, but also other cloud computing services are also gaining in popularity. Um, and then I have the data strategy. I don't really have any tools for that because data strategy, I think it's more, need more managerial skills for that. Uh, there's not really a tool you could maybe say PowerPoint to, trans to translate your knowledge, um, but there's not really a tool for that. Then I go to future trends uh, as the last thing. Um, we have five future trends. The first one is uh, Java. Java, yeah. So as you've seen in the first video, Java is one of the most popular tools and it still uh, continues to dominate. Uh, so it's still one of the largest uh, programming languages. So it's based on C++, but it's way more extensive and uh, if you're looking to work in the big tech companies, so for example, Amazon, Netflix, LinkedIn, all those uh, frameworks are based on Java. So if you're interested to go work uh, in, in a company like that, I think it's uh, very, very good uh, to learn that. And then we have Dockers as the next one. And as I already said, Dockers is for app developers and it's for an agile way of working very good. Uh, so what it does, it, it makes all the software packages into containers, also the very modular data, data concept, and all these containers together form the software or the tool. Uh, and therefore you can have one team working on one container, one team working on another container, one team working on another container. And then of course you have the, the overall vision, um, but yeah, that's very, I think, uh, good and most more popular becoming uh, way of working. As a third, I have Python. Uh, Python is also, it's still gaining in popularity, I think. 
Um, and what is the nice thing about Python is that it's all open source, as you, I think, all know. But that means that it's it's very fast growing in, in libraries. So everyone can write code. It's very easy to share code. Uh, and therefore, for machine learning and AI purposes, you have, yeah, I think lots of opportunities and pre-written code. Uh, so Python is very nice for that. The fourth trend is Swift. Uh, Swift is uh, a programming language developed by Apple. Uh, it's completely open source. So they uh, first had everything in Objective-C and then they uh, changed everything to Swift. And the goal of that was to make more easy, uh, very easy to interpret intuitive language. Uh, and that has grown actually very fast. So it's very popular in the US. So I think if you want to work in the US, it could be very, uh, you could very well learn it. Um, it's not that popular in, in uh, Europe yet, um, but I think it's gaining popularity very fast. And then the last one is DevOps. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the, the term, but I will explain it a bit. So DevOps stands for development and operations. Um, and it's also sometimes called CICD, so continuous integration and continuous development. And the idea is that you work in very interactive feedback loops. So they call it the eight loops, uh, as you can see here. Uh, and you, uh, so it's, the idea is to, to build your whole software or tool in, in very small parts and you go through this loop for each of the parts. Um, so you plan a specific task, then you code it, then you build it, then you test it. And when you've tested it, you immediately release it, you deploy it, you operate it, and it's being monitored. And from the monitoring, you see, oh, hey, there's a thing which is not going right. You plan it, you code it, you build it, you test it, etc. And then you go like that interactively. Uh, so you could see that, for example, in an app. Uh, if you have on your phone, you each time get an, uh, an update from each app. Uh, that's this way of working uh, mostly. Uh, so it's very often combined with an agile or scrum way of working. So that was it. The uh, last note, um, I want to say that uh, you can learn a new language faster than you think. So I myself am a consultant and as a consultant means that you actually have to program in the language of, that your client uses. So for example, I've been at four different banks now and all of them use a different language. And that means also that I learned four different languages uh, in the past two years, which is very nice, I think. Um, but you also must yeah, think for yourself, it's not that if I want to learn Python, I cannot learn, learn R because I have been using MATLAB during my whole studies. And then I uh, did an internship where I had to do R and within three months, you can actually change uh, and, and learn it. Because if you understand the basics and if you understand how things work, uh, then you can easily learn a new language. So that's uh, my last uh, thing that I wanted to say. Thank you all for your attention. I don't know uh, if there are any questions. Yes, thank you so much, Henry. And that was very clarifying. And it's really great to see that there is such an active uh, chat as well going on. People put uh, even more uh, uh, coding languages there like SAS and Julia and Snowflake. And uh, there was a discussion about Azure versus AWS. So I think that's really great. And um, if you can stay along, maybe to join in a little bit on the chat, that would be uh, a great, but thank you for now. And we do have some questions from, uh, from the audience for you as well, of which I'll pick a few. Um, one is from Gabriella. What is the importance of having software engineering skills as a, as a data scientist as well? We talk now most about coding skills, but what do you think of that? Like having clean code, testing, is that something that you encounter in your work? Yes, definitely. So if you're working in a team, uh, I think it's, it's very important. For example, you already mentioned clean code. Uh, it's very important to do that because you have to, you're not only making it for yourself, uh, you're making it for the company. So you always have to leave something that is very easy to in understand for someone else also. Uh, so yeah, I, I must say that I think it's very important. All right. 
Um, and and um, one one other question. So you talked about Python and the importance of Python, right? Um, and that it still is a huge trend. And people are wondering, um, since you're working in the Netherlands, do you see that people uh, work remotely uh, on Python as Python programmers? So Python developers yes. from abroad? Yes, definitely. I think actually uh, being a data scientist or software engineer is one of the jobs that is most suited to work from home because you can really um, dive into your, your coding and you won't get distracted that much. And uh, so, for example, when we went to the office, it was uh, sometimes very quiet, but if people were talking, you were distracted very easily. So I think, uh, yes, people are working from home uh, much with it. And I think also, yeah, Python, every company where they use Python and, and where they're working from home now, uh, there are definitely many uh, people working from home in Python. All right, thank you so much. Um, I think there are still um, more and more questions in the in the chat. I want to ask the audience who is here if you would like to have your questions answered live to put it in the uh, Q and A, uh, so we can ask it to the speakers. And um, Henriette and Vivienne, if you could stay on board and if you want to mingle in the chat with uh, some more discussion and questions, um, that would be lovely. Uh, but for now, thank you for your time, and uh, this was very clarifying uh, for me as well. Um, so thank you for being here, both of you. Um, and um, thanks for hosting. Will, yes, of course. Um, and we will move on uh, with uh, to the next part of the program with uh, Long Hao Lam, um, and he will talk to us about a career in data science. Um, Long Hao is a very experienced uh, consultant, data scientist. Uh, works has been working for a freelancer, but it was already. In this uh, in this field many years ago and the, the the coding languages were different but I think the uh, the core of it was uh, was the same um, and he will tell you a little bit about what it is to move into a data science career and what the perspectives are um, and the opportunities um, so please um, um, fill in all your questions in the Q&A that you would like to have answered by Long Hao and uh, I'll give the floor to you now uh, Long Hao welcome okay um... Thank you, Christella. Um, uh, it's a little bit ad hoc session for me. Uh, I, I haven't got that much slides, uh, just, just one to be honest, uh, and, and, and I will share it with you. Um, so can you see this slide? Um, yes, we can see it. OK, so my name is Long Hao. Um, I'm, I'm working as a freelance data scientist now in the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, I've been working as a data scientist for quite some time now, since 97, um, uh, before the field was called data science. Um, so I've witnessed a couple of hype cycles, so to say, um, and also some changing tools, of course. Uh, and I can tell you a little bit about that. Uh, and why I think data science is uh, such a cool area to, to be working in. So back in 97, when I finished my study statistics, um, I, I wasn't called a data scientist then. I was just, my first job title was an applied statistician. Uh, now that sounds a little bit boring. So, uh, but in fact, uh, it is still a lot, what I'm doing today is, is still applied statistics. So, um, I was creating models to predict which of the customers of ABN Animal Bank would relocate, move from one house to another house, because that's an important event in, in the lifetime of a, of a mortgage. Um, just classical logistic regression uh, in SPSS. Uh, sounds very boring if you say that is the work of a data scientist, but uh, today I'm still using logistic regression not in SPSS anymore, but in, in Python. But over the years, as you see in this picture, uh, things have evolved. But, but I would claim that it's merely an evolution in, in, in hype. <laughs> in underlying techniques and underlying data and, 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 and iterating with the business, uh, not that much has changed, to be honest. And so the end of the 90s, we got this hype data mining 
think some of you will remember uh, if you're that old. Uh, there was a big hype. Uh, I went to a lot of conferences and people were predicting that by the turn of the millennium, if companies did not use data mining, they would collapse because, uh, well, the competition would do it and your company would be left alone without uh, insights. That never happened. <laughs> well, company went bust, but not because they were not doing data mining. And then I switched from tool to SOS. <laughs> I also worked uh, for SOS, which is a very nice company to work for. Uh, lots of benefits, lots of nice uh, things that they give to employees. Um, and yeah, you have tools like SOS Enterprise Miner, SOS Enterprise Guide. None of these tools are, are heavily used now. Um, but 15 years ago, when you knew SOS, you were sort of king of the hill. <laughs> Uh, you, you had a prosperous career in front of you. Um, not anymore now, but uh, yeah. So then of course, and, and this is a long period, let's say from 2000 until 2010, uh, you had this data mining uh, period. Then we got the hype of big data uh, and, and data science, right? Um, so, Things move to open source quickly, uh, quite rapidly. Uh, and first, R was a big thing. Um, R existed a long time. I used it already in my university. I wrote uh, some introduction books about it. Um, it. It wasn't that much of a popular language before 2010. Uh, but when this big data hype came along, uh, R became very popular. And I did a lot of projects uh, with R, let's say 2010, 2011. Um, and then when the field of data scientists started to become really popular, um, yeah, Python came along, new tools came along, let's say Data IQ, H2O, uh, all, all, all these fancy tools. Um, and also the, uh, uh, from the last few years, the data scientist is not sexy anymore. It's now ML engineer or AI specialist or full stack data scientist. And, and I'm a little bit skeptical about these terms <laughs> um, because what I see over the years and also at a lot of different companies where I did projects for, um, the tool or the term is not that important. It's how you can manage as a data scientist with the stakeholders, the business. Um, I've seen a lot of companies that set up data science innovation labs or data labs uh, without a real connection with the business. So they were doing fancy projects, but they didn't know what problem they were solving. So most of these data science labs already collapsed. Uh, so <laughs> a lot of um, use cases were thought of as, very, as being very interesting, being very uh, hip to do. Um, but if you don't have a connection with the business, then you can make a very fancy deep learning model um, and you may enjoy doing that. But um, if it doesn't solve a problem in the business, then it usually doesn't last very long. Um, and that is still going on. Um, and it was 20 years ago also. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 that's in a short story, uh, a, a little bit of, about the evolution over 20 years time, so to say, of, of, of data science, statistics. Can I ask you something about that, Long Hao? Because yeah, we, sure. Yeah, because yeah, we actually got a good question, I think, uh, in the Q&A. Um, you talk about these hype cycles, right? Um, and we see this in, in AI. And uh, someone is asking, when do you think will be the next AI winter? Wow, that's a good question. I, I think now there's a lot of uh, hype on AI, whatever that may mean, because uh, I hear so many companies talking about, yeah, we don't, we don't need a data scientist, we need an AI specialist. And I, <laughs> I always ask, what's the difference? But I think for the AI winter, yeah, I mean, there was a first AI winter already, but that was more like an academic AI winter, where there were less papers published by 
academics on, on AI. But if I look in, and, and I, I don't have a strong connection with the academic world because I'm not a researcher, but if I look at companies, I think there will come an AI winter, maybe not so much as a winter, but more as a realization that AI doesn't solve everything. And so that's a trend you already see coming. A lot of data science, machine learning or AI projects fail. And what do I mean with fail? Companies don't get the value out of an AI project as from the start that they thought of. And I mean, that's a big thing because yeah, uh, if companies realize that AI doesn't solve all their problems, you will get less and less projects in AI. But don't be worried, I think there's enough market. <laughs> so it's not it's not just it's not the winter but it's just a, a, a small dip in uh, the new number of projects that company will pick up um, so you there's still you think there'll still be plenty to do for the people who are moving into uh, into data science yeah, yes my my <laughs> my, my well, presentation well, now is, is of course to convince people to do data science <laughs> there is still a, a, a career of course but I would say I would still argue that because there's a big number of companies who don't do anything with data, and if you don't do anything with data, you can still uh, do AI projects. But maybe you shouldn't call them AI projects, but you should manage their expectations. You, you you're starting this data journey as a data scientist. You do investigation in the problems in so. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do, of course. Um, but and and I think... what kind of jobs? Because you've se you've seen quite a lot, right? You you've seen many companies, different kind of positions. What can people expect from a career in data science? Where will they they end up? Do you think? Yeah, well, the, the the nice thing for data scientists is I, I started to study mathematics because I like to have a general formula or general model that can be applied in one company but also in another company. And to give you an example, I did my first uh, job at the Municipal Health Service, KKD, um, where I was creating a survival analysis model to predict how long it would take before you got infected and you got the illness, the incubation period. Now, it's a completely medical setting, but I used a model, of course, a mathematical model, Cox Proportional Hazard Model. Um, a few years later, I worked at ABN Amro Bank and I was predicting how long it would take before people moved, as I told you, right? If, if, the, if you buy a house, it takes a couple of years, then you will move or relocate to another house. Completely different setting, but it's exactly the same model, <laughs> mathematically. Um, and that's what I like. So then one project or one company, you're talking to medical people and the other, maybe the next job, you will talk to people for mortgages and then I work at Adidas, you will talk to marketeers. So to me personally, that's a nice uh, change of setting so from now and then. Um, yes. And, so and if why... I may be the, the devil's advocate, what is a reason not to go into data science? Like what, for example, for what type of person would it not be a fit? Well, <laughs> that's a difficult question because uh, I, I think you, should enjoy, of course, mathematics, statistics. That's the whole basic uh, uh, underlying knowledge that you should have. Um, so yeah, basically I can answer that question in a different way. If you don't like statistics, if you don't like data analysis, <laughs> uh, if you don't like working with different coding languages, uh, th then you shouldn't go into data science, of course. Uh, because as you see in this slide, the, the tooling will come and go. No, now it's Python, maybe in a few years, it's a different language, Julia or Swift or whatever. Uh, you should be prepared to learn something new every year, basically. Uh, now yes, it's also you have to be to... eager to learn as well. Yes, of course. And, and that's true for many occupations, right? So if you're a doctor or you're a lawyer, you, you should also keep up. But I think with data science, the pace is a little bit faster. Um, 
And of course, uh, data science is not all about technique. Uh, data science is also in some sense like business consulting. So if I go to a new project, um, the first thing I do is not install Python and, and, and deep learning packages. I need to talk to the business, the, the, the owner of the problem. What, what is going on in this company? Why are people churning, the customers churning? Um, and so that becomes more uh, business consulting almost. Uh, and do you think, because actually someone is asking in the, in the Q&A about uh, auto ML, uh, which is auto machine learning, yeah, I think. Yeah. Right? Um, is that because um, that m might mean that more parts get of your job get automated and it becomes more important to be a business consultant? Or are there other subsets of a data scientist that are more vulnerable to, to AutoML? What do you think? Yeah, so AutoML is this part of this technology that can generate uh, from a given data set many, many models uh, without the data scientist needing to think about it actually. Now, creating a model is only a small part of the whole data science journey. Um, so I'm not afraid that AutoML will automate my job because as I said, the business consulting part is very important. And also once you've got a model, you need to deploy it. You need to explain it. You need to tell people how to use it. But also, how did you get to that model? You need to investigate the data. Um, you need to look into that. There are certain things that is difficult to uh, automate with tools at, at the moment. And, and AutoML, of course, is an automation of building a machine learning model. But that's only a small part of the project. Um, but interesting enough, because with AutoML, you can turn on push a button and you get nice models. So you don't have to think about that. So it, say, it, it, it will save you time that you need uh, to, to talk with the business. That is a skill that will remain important. Yes, so I, I, mean, I, I think that is the most important skill as a data scientist. You should be able to communicate and understand and framing the business pain into a mathematical or, or machine learning model. Uh, and then how to train a model. Yeah, the, 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 then you can push on this button out to ML or you can do it yourself, of course, which is also a fun thing to do. Yeah. And, and do you see, because in the previous session, um, uh, Henrietta also told, told us that at a lot of companies, it was still a lot, you, you've talked ta talked about this evolution, right? But she said, okay, Excel is still very often used. Do you see that as well? Or um, what does, do you see as the most important thing to learn? Yes, Excel is still used and, and, and Power BI also. Uh, so as a data scientist, you should also be willing to do things that are not necessarily high skill data science techniques. So I'm doing a project now uh, at MN and they're not quite advanced in data science. And I know that. So uh, their first thing is to get insights. So you can build a dashboard which you show some nice visuals. And to them, that's already very cool. <laughs> uh, for a hardcore data scientist, you might think, yeah, this is not so cool, but uh, you have to gain trust into the business. You have to give them insights first. I mean, this, this is where a company that never used data science, right? And they want to use data science, but you cannot run before you can walk. So um, you should be willing to use tools as Excel and Power BI or, or any other BI tool not because you just want to do that as a data scientist, but to gain trust in uh, stakeholders. Right, right, thank you. And, and one other point that I wanted to raise as a last question, because um, I, th I think it's interesting in the, in the Q and A, it's about ethics. Uh, where do you draw the line of, of uh, right and wrong reasons to use uh, data and, and in predictive modeling? Um, 
do you see this evolve? Have you seen this evolving in 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 your career? And and what do you see happening now? Yes, I well, I was once asked to work for a company that produced cigarettes, um, and I said no, I'm not going to do that. So that on, on that level, there are certain companies that I don't want to work with or work for, um, because I don't believe in, and that's a personal thing, that I could work for a company that helps people smoke. <laughs> um, and with data science, you can improve their revenue or, uh, so that's that, that's for me a line. And of course, for everyone else, that, that's, that's different. That's just personal. Some people think that big banks are <laughs> nasty guys. Um, so, on, on the other hand, there are, when you're doing uh, data science, there are, of course, also legal and ethical borders. So, if you're creating a model, I worked at ABN Emmer Bank, there's a strict guideline, and, and, and most companies now have these guidelines. You cannot use certain fields, right? Uh, certain characteristics of, of customers, let's say gender, uh, political belief. That, that, that sort of things. Um, for banks, they have to follow strict guidelines. For other companies, it, it, it might be a little bit trickier because maybe they build models that are not in regulation under, under uh, regulation. Um, so yeah, I was once working at a company where we had this app, we were analyzing app behavior and we were thinking, oh, uh, a customer A and a customer B, we have the geolocation. If they are close together, we know that they are partners or at least they, they sleep in the same house. <laughs> um, can we use that information? <laughs> well, well, technically we could, but uh, from a marketing point of view, yeah, you, you, you are crossing a little bit of a border. I can and see also, how that's a complicated one, yeah. Yeah, and also another example is uh, a certain cable company uh, was selling uh, premium packages um, to, to watch, so uh, movies. And one of them was uh, erotic uh, packages and the other was gay packages uh, that people could uh, buy on top of their subscription. Now, there was once an idea, can we predict who is going to like gay uh, the, the channel? <laughs> um, oh, wow. Yeah, so I mean, I mean these are just a few examples. And I think as a data scientist, you will work with, it depends on the company, of course, but you will work with sensitive data, or let's say transactions from a bank, or uh, if you work at a cable company and you know which customers yeah. are watching gay movies. Yeah, it's, very it's important not to forget what you're talking about, right? It might seem like just data, but in the end you're talking about, uh, about it's people. people. Yeah, yeah, so I, I was working at the municipal health service. Long, I'm really sorry, but I'm we're actually I, I, we could talk about this for hours, but we have to move on. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, no, no, no. It's great to hear. I think especially these real life examples, they're they're really nice because like like we're concluding, it's really easy to to forget that we're talking about people and their choices in uh, in life and that we can influence them. Uh, so it's a very responsible job that you have and that you have. Uh, been carrying out for uh, for years um, yeah. in a good uh, manner, I think. So, thank you so much for giving uh, a bit of insights in this to our uh, our students uh, and the people who are considering a career in data science. You're more than welcome to uh, to stay along for a little bit to answer some questions in the Q and A or uh, or the chat. But uh, thank okay. you for now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, and next up, we're moving, uh, we're still talking about a data science career, but from a very different perspective, because we're going to talk to uh, uh, Teddy. Uh, and Teddy is a tech recruiter, a very experienced tech recruiter. Um, oh, Long Hao, could you stop your uh, screen sharing? Yes, perfect. Um, and Teddy, please turn on your cam and uh, audio and um, welcome to this virtual summit. Um, Thank you. I am trying to push my video on, but it says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Um, oh, I didn't. Okay. Oh. Let me see. We should be. Yes. Ah, <laughs> Hi. <there you> <laughs> 
<laughs> Welcome. Good to see you again. And thanks for being here in the virtual uh, summit. We have uh, around 90 people with us live uh, with a lot of questions in the in the chat and the Q&A. So if you have any questions for Teddy, please leave them in the Q&A. Um, uh, so really great to have you. Could you, uh, you tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is you do? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Teddy. I'm originally Bulgarian, but uh, I live in the Netherlands for the past 12 years. Um, I've been in a tech recruitment and talent management uh, for uh, five years now. Um, I'm helping startups and scale-ups grow, mostly in the Netherlands. A couple of times I did it also for uh, remote companies. And in tech, I mean, anything that you can think from uh, developers to scientists and so on. Um, I help people find a job and I find companies find uh, people. So uh, I see it from, uh, from all the perspectives that are out there in the job market. And that's I uh, love to help people to find jobs. Actually, I love to help them more than I love to help companies, but uh, don't tell that to the companies. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to be able to share some of my knowledge today. I know that um, in our world, um, there are a lot of candidates, there are a lot of companies looking for people, and there are a lot of question marks about what are recruiters looking for, what are companies looking for. So please, let's make this a little bit also interactive. If you have any questions, drop it in the Q&A. Uh, I'm very happy to help you. Great, thank you, Teddy. Um, let me start with my uh, first questions. Um, what are the latest trends that you see in the field of tech and especially uh, data recruitment? So, um, I see that, well, basically it's uh, the trend of uh, the way they call it the war of talent. I think everybody has heard about it. Um, there are more and more job openings happening in the tech world, uh, digitizing. Um, I think it's not even a trend anymore. It's a lifestyle. Um, more and more companies are getting into data. Uh, big data is a very big word. And what is actually happening is that a lot of companies are going on the wave of data, data science, uh, big data, and, and all those buzzwords. Uh, but very often they don't know what they're doing. So um, it's, it's very interesting to, to see how um, I have had clients that would uh, tell me, oh, Teddy, please help us find a data analyst. And then we end up hiring a data engineer or help us find a data scientist. And then we figure out that we don't need a data scientist because this is not what the person is supposed to do, but we actually need an engineer and so on. So it's, um, I see a little bit of a confusion still in, in this world. Let's see, we have a Sorry. question. I was oh, uh, don't I, worry. I couldn't find my button for a second. We did actually already get some questions during the previous sessions that I think would be really interesting to uh, to ask to you, um, which is, uh, I, I recognize the confusion, uh, uh, by the way. Um, what, um, how do you look at online uh, degrees now with, with COVID? Do you see a change in how it is assessed by, by companies? Is it uh, valued the same as an offline degree or do you see a difference? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, I don't have a, a direct observation on that because um, most of the people that I've been hiring for, uh, companies that I've been hiring for, um, haven't had explicit requirements uh, based on the education. Um, what I can say for sure is that companies are really looking when it comes to tech uh, specifically, I'm not talking here about uh, finance and marketing and things like that, but specifically in the tech industry, they're really looking for experience. You can have five degrees from the most amazing Harvard type of universities in the whole world. 
But if you don't have the years of experience and, and um, even and I'm talking hands-on in the company experience, not uh, uh, pet projects and uh, some hobby stuff, it doesn't matter. Um, I see also a trend coming up. A lot of the, the recruiters and, and HR people, talent managers and everything, we're starting to push more and more companies to stop looking at degrees because, um, and maybe the, some people will, that might open a very big discussion right now and I'm aware of it, but degrees are not relevant anymore. In my what personal- I, yeah. <laughs> um, what I mean by that is that um, you need uh, to go maybe to university to learn the, 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 the basics of, uh, of some uh, education, of some profession, be that computer sciences or, or um, okay, we're not talking about doctors here, obviously, but um, especially in computer sciences, um, you can learn so much things nowadays without even going to university that um, it's irrelevant in the sense of what I said, you can have five degrees, but if you have five years of experience, that matters much more. Um, I'm not saying don't go to university, please do. If you want to go, you're gonna learn a lot of things, uh, but um, I can just give you a very simple Example, um, I spoke to a developer a couple of weeks ago and we're looking for a Python developer and uh, he never worked with Python, but he had a degree, a nano degree in, in, with Python. And um, that was not interesting for our team because they said it, it, it's great that you, that you have learned the basics, but we really need someone who knows how to work with it hands-on. Yeah, so it's more about, about skills and experience than having a certain certificate, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And so how then, um, especially for starters, where, because if, if companies are mainly looking for experience, how yeah. do you start as a, as a junior? How do you get in? Oh, that's such a it's this is one of the most frustrating things in in my in my career is I think for many people loop. because I see yeah. it in the Q and A and in the chat so it's it's a thing yeah it's a closed loop it's terrible because they want you to have an exp to have experience but then in the end no company is hiring juniors and and help them uh, learn so <sighs> yeah where do you start you okay so. I'll just tell you to uh, work on your pet projects. So that's incredibly uh, important. If you're a junior, you have to spend time outside of your working hours to, to work on extracurricular stuff. Uh, if you have a degree, if you have a nano degree or whatever degree, you learn something new, put it in practice immediately because that matters a lot. And um, Especially what I see a lot. Um, last time when when I was talking with you, Cristela, we had a, we had a, a guy that got in touch with me after uh, after the conversation that we had during the panel discussion, and he was in data science and he didn't have a degree and he couldn't get hired anywhere, and it was so frustrating because he was a great guy and he knew a lot of things, um, and I advised him to go and look for a job in um, in consultancies. For me, that's the the best place where you where you have actually the biggest chance, because in startups and scaleups they look for people that are going to hit the ground up and are going to help them really bring the product to the next level. So it's not possible for a junior to to get a job over there. Um, bigger companies that's it just look at bigger companies and often consultancies would invest in you to develop you not only on the skills uh, hard skill side but also on the soft one and and what do you okay so the soft the because that's what you're saying as well that the soft uh, skills are also important right even also yeah. for the startups that yeah, yeah. and how yeah. do you look at at um, like, for example, MOOCs or more uh, pra practical education or traineeships. Uh, what do you think of those? That's really great. If you can do that, um, you, you totally should. Um, traineeships are the best way to learn, in my opinion, hands-on. 
um, they matter more than, than just the paper of the education that you got. And it, it opens you a lot of doors. The sooner you can start building relationships and the sooner you, you build a network with people that know who you are, the better. Um, it's a small world in the end of the day. Uh, it's not only because the Netherlands is small, but it's really a small world. So once you really get into uh, the world of working, no matter if it's traineeship or whatever, you, doors are starting to open for you. Yeah. So the importance of both soft skills networking, I think it might be often undervalued, right? In the, in the tech uh, field. Yeah. As well, yeah. Um, and and uh, many people in the um, in our audience are also wondering about switching careers to more towards right. tech or to data science. Um, how can someone sell their prior experience when they are switching careers as something valuable in in a new field? Uh, that's a very difficult question. Uh, the thing is that the reality, unfortunately, is that companies wouldn't care that much about your previous experience because what they care is that they have a problem and they need someone to come and fix it. You can sell it greatly when you start with your career. If you're a junior, you know, look at what matters in the position that you're looking for. So if you're a data scientist, then you, you have to do uh, with data and then that data you have to translate in certain ways, discuss it with the business as well. So if you have been a teacher before that, you're used to talk with people, you know how to present things, you're confident in front of public. Uh, that's going to even help you to sell yourself in a consultancy company because you can say, um, my students are the same like your clients. I've been convincing students to do things for many years. So for the same way, I can also communicate the right things to your clients. So you just need to, to take uh, A4, write down the, the, the strengths that you think you, you have, and then translate them into what is needed into the new field. Right. So really think, extract the skills that you you've had learned, have learned in your previous job, in your previous experience and apply it to uh, to the problem that the company you're applying for is facing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you another truth uh, that uh, probably is some uh, a lot of companies would hate me for saying it, but um, having a great interpersonal skills, soft skills and being cool, awesome, talkative person or whatever, especially in into the tech world, gives you 10,000 bonus points. And this is the sad reality. I see how companies are evaluating, and I'm not talking only about my clients, I'm talking also about the companies that I interviewed as, as a candidate uh, even 10 years ago. You know, I've experimented even with that, you know, on one interview, I'm just like very calm and I'm more listening, maybe asking questions or another interview. I'm like all over the place with ideas and everything. And I see how people perceive it. And it's it's going to take us a very long time as HR people and recruiters to teach people to not be biased and that it's impossible to teach someone not to be biased but to, to get into their heads to to look a little bit further than oh that's a cool guy or that's an awesome girl yeah yeah that's true that is true um we're uh, going through a time very quickly i think um like lara saying in the chat we're really hitting a nerve within the audience i think it's a frustration that many people feel uh one other i'm thing so I've mentioned sorry no, it's that's good. It's, it's <laughs> getting their questions answered. What um, one question uh, very specific that a few people ask? Do you ever look at uh, like, for example, people who've been in Kaggle competitions or other ways? To, how do people I love stand it. out for you? Yeah, that it's like okay, where what is the audience? We don't have under eighteen here, right? So I can. <laughs> I don't think so. No, okay. Am I okay? I'm gonna say that if you don't invite me and anymore, I'll understand. But listen, if you go on those Kaggle competitions, you're tickling the balls of hiring managers. <laughs> Straight on, honestly. Like this is the day eyes become like huge. Oh my god, this guy or this girl did that and that. It's just it's again a biased thing, but it's it's a great way to show it. 
it, it says something about you. It, it says a lot about you if you're doing those things. It says that you're entrepreneurial, that you want to, you're competitive, you want to achieve things, you, you want to learn, you, uh, it says so much things. It can be interpreted only in positive ways. So um, I even talked with some of my clients and we were talking about setting up those Kaggle competitions in terms of employer branding to get data scientists. So it's it's definitely a really good way to draw attention to yourself and put it also on your LinkedIn, by the way. Perfect. Um, thank you. <laughs> Last question, um, but maybe you've answered it uh, already a little. Do you have any advice on people who are uh, want to uh, who are remote, who are not in the Netherlands for landing job uh, jobs with the companies in the Netherlands? Do you hire remotely, for example? Peeps, I'm going to be very honest with you. 90% of the companies here in the Netherlands are not ready yet to hire remotely. So don't give up. Try to do so, uh, to, to, to apply. And it's changing, because the more think, right? Now with COVID? Mm, it, <sighs> Honestly, I the only thing that I hear from the companies around me is when can we go back to the office? And they're really talking about when we go back to normal, that maybe we can work one day in the week from the office or maybe uh, from home. So a lot of companies are still not convinced uh, about uh, working remotely. Um, I see a lot of talent actually from the Netherlands slowly exiting because there are many more companies that work remotely outside of the Netherlands. Okay, yeah, so, I think that's very interesting because we have an international audience as well. So uh, it's good for them uh, to know. Uh, one last advice, if they do land an interview here, what is the best thing you can do in, a, in an interview? Um, so the Dutch culture is uh, very well known for being being direct but when you're direct they don't appreciate it sorry dutchies but uh, <laughs> this is my experience i'm not dutch so i'm allowed to say that um the best thing what you can do is be yourself be um self-reflective this is something that i'm going to give you no matter if you're a data scientist in in what world you're working and whatever self-reflection knowing what your strengths and what your weaknesses are and what you want to achieve in the coming years is going to serve you a lot and if you're honest with the company that you're talking with and they don't appreciate the fact that you said my biggest weakness is that i am really focused on the details and sometimes I really forget to have the big overview, but I'm working on it. If they reject you because of that, this is not the company that you want to work for. So be honest because only the company that really would appreciate you will appreciate when you're honest about your strengths and weaknesses. Thank you. I think that's very nice advice to, uh, to end uh, this session with. Um, um, would be great if you have the time, Teddy, if you could stay along uh, to mingle a bit in the Q&A in the chat. There were a lot of questions for you. Um, so yeah. uh, they are in the Q&A and you can, if you want, type your answer. But if not, thank you so much for your time and for being here, for your honesty um, <laughs> and your frank jokes. Uh, I am a Dutch in that sense. I like it. So um, thank you. You're welcome. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, um, just find me on LinkedIn, uh, just Teddy Dimitrova. Um, I do job coaching on the site. Um, I have some free slots every week. I'm doing that pro bono, just uh, helping people. So if you if you want to ask some questions or you have some need some advice, feel free to reach out to me. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Christella. Bye bye. Bye. Um, so we'll move on to uh, to our next part. Uh, thank you all for being here, for sending in all your questions. Um, it's really great to have you all from all over the world. Very exciting for us. Um, I also see people asking um, for ways to connect with each other. Uh, we'll definitely work on something for you to uh, connect you to each other. So let me get back to that. Um, for now, uh, I want to welcome Anya. Um, she's going to be our next speaker. Hi, Anya. Good to see Hello. you. Hi. Hi. Um, 
so I think it will be, re I'm really looking forward to your talk. We just spoke with Teddy uh, about uh, data science uh, recruitment and she also had a lot to say about education and the value of education, what not to choose, how it is valued. I'm really curious to hear your perspective uh, uh, on this and uh, would like to give the floor to you. Thank you. I'll start sharing my screen. I did listen to this presentation. It was very interesting. I, in some sense, agree with a lot of what she is saying, but uh, with a slightly different take on it. Um, so just to tell you all a little bit about me and what I do. Oops. Um, I work as a consultant at a company called Simotions. We do different consultancy projects. And although most of the time the clients indeed think of me as a data scientist, it's not only building predictive models that I do. It's actually doing that, up, of course, like I absolutely love being able to predict the future. That's when you can really feel that you're using the data, but also a lot of companies want to know how are they performing right now? So not only what's gonna happen in the future. And for that, you need to create analysis. And if you've already done any of the data projects, you know that your output is only as good as the data that you're actually putting into your research and in, into your models. And I spend a lot of my time actually improving the data quality of the data that the companies have and optimizing and streamlining their data processes. And that kind of brings me to one very big issue here that Sadly, you need to start applying for deg degrees or courses before a lot of you will know what kind of a data professional you want to be. It's not only data scientists and data engineers. There are a lot of different roles that you might need to do. And it's of course best if you do what you enjoy because of course data scientists have a nice salary and it's all very sexy. But if you're not doing what you are enjoying, why are you spending your days doing it? Um, how I became a data scientist, I firstly took advantage of the fact that uh, Scottish educational system allows you to actually do a joint degree. So I did a degree which focused on the management and on the mathematics. So this way I was able to really understand how companies work as well as learn the fundamentals of statistics, linear algebra, calculus, which are the basis of what, um, like, of what are the models that you use in data science. After that, I followed my uh, first degree was a research master in social and behavioral sciences here in the Netherlands. And I focused on statistics and methodology. And really there, I've realized that I have this passion for really working with data and being able to predict what's going to happen and use the models, shape the data in a way that's useful for other people. So we got a lot of hands-on projects during a research master's. So if you are thinking of doing master's, I would definitely recommend thinking of towards research-oriented ones. And I would definitely say that for me, my education still continues as a consultant really on the job because you learn from your colleagues you uh, go to different courses whenever needed because you realize that the tools are changing, that there are different um, things that companies prefer more or less, and you kind of adapt. And I know it actually looks like I've planned my education very well. And almost from the start, I went heads on into data science. But um, the truth is, I really didn't know what a data scientist is when I started um, my first degree. I was really overwhelmed by the choice and I just went for something that I do enjoy uh, learning about. And that is definitely what I would suggest to you. So do go and gather information about something that you like, because that would also guide you towards the kind of data professional that you want to be. So instead of looking at how to choose a good degree and an institute, I suggest to you thinking about how to become a good data professional, because at the end of the day, it's not just landing a job that you need to do. You also probably want to be good at what you're doing. And I know that a lot of courses focus on toolkit, 
And that's something like machine learning, artificial intelligence. Python is especially very popular. But you should realize that these, uh, these tools will be changing throughout your uh, yeah, professional life. So although you should definitely learn them if you want to use them, but do understand that it's not that if now you're using Python, you will be using Python for the next 40 years. It might be that another tool comes around and then you'll need to learn that one. What I would focus a bit more is understanding the business processes and soft skills. Because what's very important about any data professional is to be able to make a difference with the data. And if you understand how the business operates, you know where you can um, yeah, make that change, where you can actually bring that value with the data. And um, soft skills, as already were mentioned before me, they're very important. Of course, definitely for landing a job, but also for working because you need to be able to communicate with your colleagues and to explain what is it that you found. You can be a fantastic data scientist and work with the most cutting edge models, but if you cannot explain then what is it you're doing and why you're doing it, it's going to sound a little bit like you are taking your numbers out of thin air. So you should be able to convince the business that what you're actually finding is also what's likely to happen. And um, lastly, but not least, you should inspire people to work with data because this data-driven approach of working is still very new for a lot of companies. So there are a lot of people who, who are just not ready for it. They've had maybe 10 years to adapt or maybe they thought that their company will take 40 years and all of a sudden their management is bringing this data-driven strategy. So you should definitely make sure that other people don't think of data as scary, and that takes soft skills. Um, I would first uh, advise you to focus on a program, not so much as an institute. And um, if you do know what kind of uh, things you want to do with data, then this will be a bit easier for you. If you want to be a real data scientist, in the sense that you want to, to build predictive models, maybe work even with robotics, then I'd advise you to do a degree that has a very rigorous mathematics and statistics in it. However, if that's probably not your cup of tea and you want to work more towards data management, data engineering, data stewards, so that's more people who prepare the data, clean the data, gather the data, mathematics and statistics might be relevant for what you're doing. It's still nice to have an idea of those, of the concepts of, uh, uh, yeah, the kind of things that people will be using because still what you're doing will then be passed on to data scientists, but it's not going to be as useful for you in your job. So then I would focus more on computer science or maybe specific tooling. Um, what really helps also is for you to think, do you have any prior experience? If you're changing careers, for example, and you have a lot of business experience already, it might be that the business side of the education might be a bit less relevant for you. Just to give a more concrete example, if you've already worked in a marketing field and then you just want to become a data scientist who works in particularly in marketing, you don't really need to take marketing courses because you already know how things work there and there you just need to focus on the tooling and maybe on statistics. And um, Likewise, if you have research and analytical experience, so if you've been working at a university, maybe you have already have a lot of analytical projects that you've done, you, perhaps you even published papers, those are all very valuable. And it might even be that you don't need to do a full on degree and just taking a couple of courses will suffice for you. I also would strongly advise you to think of such things as length of your education and building your portfolio, also what has been kind of mentioned before, because if you, haven't, uh, if you haven't done a degree before, it might actually be a good idea to do a slightly longer one to just give yourself the time to build your portfolio. And those can be absolutely things from Kegel and GitHub and all those nice uh, 
again, almost game-like ideas that you can do. But also during your university, you can have a lot of research projects. And that's where, for example, I was very happy to have a research master because we had um, almost a full year where we were just focused on our own projects. And that wasn't education per se related. We really were choosing what to do ourselves. And likewise, in uh, University of St. Andrews, um, there was a very big element of business projects. And that is because I did a management degree, absolutely. But uh, we actually went to different companies. We did consultancy specific projects where we used data. So that uh, did help me to build some of my portfolio. Um, and if I think of uh, which institute to go for, then uh, location would be the key one for me. Because if, you've, if you're applying to a university in the US, you will have connections from the US, most likely. Of course, it's now changing with COVID. More people are going to do remote degrees, but still predominantly people do tend to go for what they know more and um, to choose universities closer to home. So you can expect to have more Dutch people at a Dutch university. And then if you would like to work in a Dutch market, Perhaps the Dutch university is a better choice for you, for you because you can build the connections and that includes your professors who might have even been doing projects in companies and can connect you with the right people. Or um, a lot of universities run mentorship programs and those uh, can really help you connect with people in the industry. Um, as far as I know, University of St. Andrews is running such a program. I'm involved in it. There is a student that I've helped uh, with a couple of things and I would like to know how she's doing. And if you can have such help, that's great because it's a person who can really explain to you what is hot right now. What do you want to apply for? And just don't forget that learning on a job will be very important. So do think of your first job as an institute where you're going to learn. Um, I would like to give you one example because we actually run an academy as well because we recognize that indeed a lot of employers um, don't want to have a completely fresh person um, from the university and they want to have a bit of experience. So we run a six-week program where we address the tooling that's the most hot one, like those toolings that are most hot on the market. So for, for us currently, it's Python, R, and uh, Power BI. And we give real life business projects to our candidates. And also on top of that, help them with their conversation skills, presenting skills, advisory skills. And uh, the people who go through this academy, we actually afterwards even help them find a job because indeed we realize that it's so, so difficult now to land that first job without any experience. And the companies do want you to yeah, already know what's going to happen, even as a junior. So I do have one more advice for you on this stage, is don't look just for positions of data scientists. The truth is a lot of companies don't know what they need, exactly what they said before me. And they also call this profession as something that appeals more to them. So it can be data analyst, data specialist, data scientist, sometimes even data engineers, actually a data analyst, or they just, or they would say something like CRM specialist, which can actually still be data scientist, just specifically for marketing data. So my advice for you is to really look through the vacancies and see what kind of tooling, what kind of education they want. And if what you want to do is also described there, then you will have an idea for what kind of knowledge you still need to gather. Um, so if you do get interested in this Emotions Academy, the link on the website is visible right now. You can also contact me afterwards and I can tell you more about it or about any other um, programs that you might be interested. And if any of you have any questions, I would love to answer them. So stop sharing. Thank you, Anya. I think that was, um, uh, that was very nice to hear your perspective as well. 
um, especially after uh, uh, the perspective from mm -hmm. Teddy and hear from different uh, sides. Um, what do you think of um, the uh, classical uh, university mm -hmm. education versus uh, boot camps or MOOCs or, mm -hmm. or courses? Um, what do you think, uh, which of them serves which purpose? Yeah, um, I think both of them are very useful. The more classical education helps you create that network of people and to get a bit more of an idea what life after university, that, that almost sounds contradictory, but you do get different experiences through working on a team project, maybe some research projects. And that is, of course, not only value for your skills, but also for your interpersonal skills. On the other hand, um, learning tools at university, although is possible, but much more difficult because you still have this idea of just needing to pass an exam. Mm. While when you're doing it um, online in your own time, you're doing it because you've chosen to do so. So I think then you get way more of a value for it. You also chose the tool potentially or a, a topic that you're learning. So you're doing it for a reason. And because you have that motivation, you're, it's more intrinsic motivation. I think you get... Um, bigger value in the sense of let's say hard knowledge and tooling but uh, when it comes to interpersonal skills I do think that the yeah more classical education can help more at least for me I've done a couple of online course myself I didn't feel like I managed to meet as many people as I did through my uh, other degrees yeah, that's a very good insight. And we talked actually at the beginning of this uh, summit, we also talked about the importance of, of community. Um, and I think it's very nice to hear that coming back in your, uh, in your presentation. Um, uh, thank you. It was very, very clear. And I, I love that you shared your ideas and then gave like the different perspective and what worked for you and which, mm -hmm. uh, what can work for, for different people. Because I really do think that uh, depends on what you're, you're looking for, right? Yeah. Um, absolutely yeah. it's not a one yeah one track for Korea there is no one type of data scientist I would even say because different companies need a different kind of a person and that will also be translated in the choices that you make there are a lot of companies who do not want to see graduates from those um, yeah Ivy League schools because that also brings a certain stereotype yeah exactly um, yeah, and, and, and actually, we will, we'll, it's very nice that you make that bridge because we will talk a little bit more about the uh, job searching as well in the, in the next uh, presentation. Um, thank you so much, Anya, for sharing your knowledge here today. Um, uh, like, you're more than welcome to, to stay along, maybe uh, uh, join the discussion in the chat or answer some more questions in the Q&A. Um, please, everyone, keep asking your questions. We really love uh, seeing them. Uh, we try to answer them all. <laughs> um, and thank you, uh, Anya, for now. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Um, so um, great to see that so many of you are still here. Uh, a lot of you have been here for us uh, with us for two hours now. So uh, um, stay along for when, we, when we're now slowly moving into the more practical side of, uh, of data science. Uh, we have uh, Violetta with us for our next presentation. You can... Yes. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Can Good you hear me? You. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Good to have you. Um, we've already had a, a full program with a very different perspective on the data science career. We've spoken to recruiters, we've spoken to consultants, uh, to freelancers. Um, so uh, uh, many different perspectives, also on the learning side. Um, and we're really glad to have you here for, for the next part um, to talk a little bit more about uh, portfolio building and job searching as a, as a data scientist. Um, good to know for the audience that we'll actually do two parts with Violetta. And the first one will uh, be uh, more of a presentation on her part about, about uh, the portfolio building and the job hunting. And second, we'll talk about her current job at ABN AMRO. Um, uh, so yes. like I said, we'll move more into what is it actually like to work uh, as a data scientist. So right. welcome Violetta, please introduce you. yourself a bit more and I'll give the floor to you. Yes, thank you for having me. 
Um, I plan to introduce myself actually in the um, uh, a presentation that I have. Let me just try to share my screen. Mm. Can you see my slides? Yes, okay. we can see. And I'm trying to remove this and go to, um, sorry. So many online uh, meeting tools. I'm not used to uh, working with all of them. Okay, so. Thank you for having me. My name is uh, Violeta Misheva. Uh, I am a data scientist at uh, ABN AMRO. And I have been working as a data scientist for the past five years. And I want to share with you some of the difficulties that I encountered in um, my transition uh, to a data scientist. Uh, I hope that some of the tips that I will share would be helpful for you. Of course, I'm aware that uh, everyone who goes into data, science, uh, into data science has a very different journey. So uh, your journey might look very different than, than mine, but I think that some general uh, things could, could apply to a different, um, um, different settings and scenarios. So first, a little bit more about me. Uh, I am uh, working uh, as a as a data scientist at uh, ABN AMRO Bank for the past three and a half years. So ABN AMRO Bank, for those of you who are not based in the Netherlands, is one of the uh, big Dutch banks. Uh, I am also uh, working as a facilitator at, um, uh, at ELU, where I give workshops to data scientists uh, in data science. And I am passionate about sharing my knowledge in data science and uh, that's why I have a couple of online um, uh, courses. Before uh, moving to the bank, I worked as a data science consultant for about one and a half years. So that was my first uh, industry job, basically, after I finished my academic training. And um, uh, what I did is I completed a PhD in applied econometrics from Erasmus University where I worked with uh, data to test different hypotheses and to prove or disprove a causal relationship. So basically also during my PhD, I worked a lot with data and um, uh, I knew that I wanted to transition to an industry job and to leave academia. And I was fortunate enough that at the same time, the term data scientist uh, was uh, and the job role of data scientist was becoming uh, popular and getting some traction. So I had to transition, I had to learn new skills to be able to look for and eventually find a job uh, as a data scientist. And because I have um, also before my PhD, I completed my master's in the Netherlands, I thought that okay, with education uh, gained in the Netherlands, um, and I was looking for a job in the Netherlands, I thought that, well, maybe that would give me some advantage and it would make things a bit easier for me. But still, it took me a few months to find my first job. But before I share with you some of the um, uh, difficulties that I encountered. Um, sorry, Violetta, we're, we're not seeing your screen anymore now. Did you stop no? sharing? <laughs> okay. Um, no, I did not stop sharing. Let me try again. Yes, you're back now. Okay, perfect. Okay, so before I um, tell you about some of the difficulties I, I encountered, um, you also have to understand where I'm coming from and um, um, kind of the skills that you need to have as a data scientist. This is, of course, not an exhaustive list. And um, some of the skills I already had, some other skills I did not, um, well, I did not. So I had to basically, um, yeah, learn them by taking online courses, for example. 
So for instance, if you want to get a job in data science, you need to have some computer science skills or some coding skills, preferably in some uh, open source uh, language such as Python or R. Uh, so you need to be able to clean and visualize the data, pre-process it, uh, and to do some, uh, at least the beginning uh, for a junior position, some basic programming. So this is the part that I had to learn basically because I uh, worked a lot during my research uh, with um, kind of statistical tools uh, and I had to um, yeah, really kind of pick up my programming. Statistics and machine learning, this is something that I, at least in my education, I had done quite a lot of. Uh, when it comes to that part, you need to, um, of course, um, be able to do some basic statistical analysis and hypothesis testing. You need to be able to uh, train uh, various machine learning models, be it forecasting, predicting, clustering, etc. Of course, if you're a junior, you don't really have, per se, a lot of business knowledge. You might have domain knowledge based uh, and depending on, um, let's say, your previous experience, working experience, or uh, educational experience. But that is also something that you're constantly learning uh, because you might be changing domains or even if you stay within the same, same domain. I've been working at a bank for the past three and a half years. I'm constantly uh, gaining business knowledge as well because it's a very complex organization and it takes quite a while to learn how the different parts of the bank function. And something that uh, sometimes candidates forget about um, is soft skills. You need to also be a very good communicator. You need to be able to uh, learn on, well, you need to be able to reflect on what skills you have, what skills you're lacking. Uh, and most of all, you need to be curious. You need to be motivated and uh, self-driven. So, so this is like an overview of skills uh, that you might need to have as a data scientist. And uh, I did not have all of them. I tried to fill in the gaps, but still uh, I encountered a few challenges as I mentioned. And some of the rejections that I received are uh, some of the following. So as I told you, I was focusing on uh, searching for a job uh, within the Netherlands. So. I would get rejections due to language barriers, uh, basically for not speaking fluent Dutch. And I would literally get rejections along the lines of, it's not you, it's us. And uh, I had a couple of companies, smaller companies who would tell me, yes, you were the best candidate uh, for this position, but uh, we are still a small company. We don't feel kind of comfortable speaking in English because of you. So that's why I prefer to go with someone who speaks Dutch, but come back to us after six months after your Dutch has improved. Um, the second type of rejections that I also found very strange is, um, um, well, I understand where they're coming from. Basically, it's important to have hands-on uh, programming experience and knowledge with the so, so mentioned uh, open source tools. But basically, I would get a rejection such as your knowledge of um, the respective language is theoretical, which I find very strange. How can a knowledge of uh, programming language be theoretical? But what they meant is that I did not, let's say, use R or Python uh, in my research. Um, uh, I took half a year degree to, to finish uh, certain online courses, and that's where I used it. But apparently, that was not enough, at least for that company. So, so um, identify what other skills you might, be, uh, you might be missing and do invest in them. Uh, so for example, if you come from computer science, um, I noticed also from my colleagues who uh, have computer science, uh, science training, sometimes they might be missing um, statistics and mathematics uh, or machine learning, then do invest in, uh, in learning some of that. Or if you come from mathematical uh, background, statistical background, do invest vice versa in learning some, um, some programming. And I would also get rejections because, uh, well, in my case, people would not understand uh, my research or how it helped me be a data scientist. 
um, although um, I did um, applied research, I worked with data, it sounded still very social. Um, I did a PhD in applied um, econometrics, so I worked a lot with data. And people often don't realize that, uh, well, economics and econometrics, they can be social sciences. So um, when I explained to them what I was testing, what my hypothesis was, that it sounded perhaps sometimes too simple. So uh, if you want to kind of make things easier for yourself, do uh, help, be it recruiters or hiring managers, people that you talk to kind of connect the dots because they will not per se understand where you're coming from. It is your task in a way to explain to them how your previous training and education experience, how it is relevant and helping you excel in the position that you're applying for. Uh, well, this is um, um, not the end of it. I still had a couple of um, uh, different rejections. So I had a couple of companies that told me you're overqualified for this job. And after um, getting a bit more experience with um, uh, applying for my first job and then for the second job, I kind of realized that basically they oversold, uh, oversold the job or uh, what you need what you need to be doing in the in the job. So for instance, they might uh, advertise a data scientist uh, who needs to have training in econometrics. But uh, yeah, when you talk to them, at the end, you need to be doing just some uh, data aggregation in Excel, uh, something way more simplistic than what uh, it sounded um, uh, it, it sounded at first. And then unfortunately, uh, do not take things personally because even if things are going great, um, if you have, let's say when, yeah, if it happened to me um, that I would go through a couple of rounds, um, let's say at the very last stage, um, I have a really nice feeling about uh, the position and the people in the company. And uh, I have a lot of positive feed feedback so far. And then all of a sudden they disappear and I hear nothing. So there'll be some inevitable ghosting. Do not take it personally because uh, very often it's not only, well, it's not about you. There are other factors that matter. They might want to consider how someone might fit best with the rest of the team. Uh, there might be some um, other internal political discussions going on. So there are things, unfortunately, that are out of your control. So uh, do not take it personally. But if, if I have to kind of summarize these bitter lessons in tips I can share with you. One good news is that it's much easier to get your second job than your first one. So it took me a few months to get my first job. But the second time I, um, I was looking for a data science position, it took me literally two weeks. And I, have, I had a couple of offers and I had option of where I could go. So unfortunately, you will have more, more choice the more experience you have. But uh, of course, you need, to, um, yeah, you need to start somewhere. And uh, yes, uh, there are, I'm sure that uh, other speakers have shared with you already, or they will share tomorrow, um, quite a few things that you can do. One thing that I have found useful is to invest in building up a network. So uh, attend meetups, conferences, events, because a recommendation from someone within, the, within a company increases your chance of success. I myself, when I was applying for different jobs, uh, even if it's, um, let's say, very highly competitive position with a lot of applicants, uh, just because someone who works at the company recommended me or sent my CV to the, to the right person, then I would get at least the first interview. Of course, use that wisely because people are busy. Uh, don't um, don't over uh, over abuse those uh, basically those privileges. Don't ask for too much. And invest in building a portfolio of projects. So, uh, how we can do that? Well, there are various ways. Uh, you can pick an open source data from, let's say, a, a platform like uh, like Kaggle. Um, and think about what you want to uh, show there. So do you want to uh, 
um, go at work at a specific uh, industry. If you have preferred industry, then try to pick a problem or problems from that domain. If you don't, then go for diversity of, uh, and pick a um, certain set of problems. For instance, you need to have, let's say, a regression problem. You need to have a classification problem, a supervised learning problem. You need to have uh, some NLP, etc. And most of all, focus on a problem that you care about, that you feel passionate about, uh, be it a hobby or something else. Because if it is something that's also an interest of, um, of, of yours, you are likely to uh, spend more time and effort into it and it will show. So uh, where to store that? Well, keep your GitHub up to date. Um, so if you don't have an experience as a data scientist, let's say you're entering um, um, the data science um, job market, this is one way to differentiate yourself. If you have, uh, let's say, very solid um, portfolio of projects, but uh, you know the, uh, the portfolio doesn't have to be only um, Kaggle competitions that you participated in, for example. It could also be contributions that you have done to open source packages. That's something that looks very impressive on, uh, on your, uh, in your portfolio or on your CV. Uh, you can also put there other, uh, other things, not only code. You can uh, put, let's say, presentations, preferably with code if it's possible. If you have, let's say, um, learned something and then you share it with uh, your classmates or with your network uh, in some way, let's say you gave a workshop, um, or presentation in the method that you learned, then put it there as well. Uh, it's, uh, it might help you, you never know. So this is the end of the slides that I had. And I think I am perfectly on time and I think we have questions, or oh, we have time for questions. Well done, perfectly on time and thank you. Uh, we already got some comments in the chat that it's very insightful for people. And I think it's really great for also from people from all over the world to see like the um, uh, to see the challenges that you face like it's always nice to hear that you're not the only one right and and especially since yes. you're a success story you do have a really good job in data science now so that's a hopeful message. Um, a question that we got from Nutsa is um, during your job search did you focus on the role of data science or did you use other job names or titles mm -hmm. how did you search for that yeah that's a that's a good question i think that i mostly focused on um, data scientist and uh, data analyst because uh well let's say five years ago the first time or more than five years ago that i was looking for um a job well there was uh, the term, for instance, machine learning engineer, machine learning scientist did not exist yet. Companies were just uh, coming up with uh, data scientists and data analysts. And I was applying for both because I also uh, completely agree with what the previous speaker said that very often uh, the different titles might mean something different in different companies. So um, that's why I was, I was open for, for, um, for various, uh, yeah for both titles, let's say. And and what would you recommend people now? Like if you're, cause if you're searching for, like we talked about it yeah. before that a lot of companies also don't call it data science or they call mm -hmm. it, you know, they do, but they're looking for something else. What would you really yeah. recommend people to search for? I would recommend uh, to search for, yeah, for a variety of, um, of uh, positions. So data scientist, uh, data analyst, uh, data engineer, machine learning engineer, uh, machine learning scientist. Um, yeah, those would be the first things that I would, I would start with. But of course, there are also, also within the data science itself, uh, there is already split and differentiation in the roles, not um, uh, only data scientists and data analysts, but uh, yeah, we, we also have, let's say, BI specialists. You're supposed to mostly do reports and dashboards or visualizations. We also have now people who, let's say, focus more on the translation side, on the, on the communication side. So there would be codes, advanced analytics translators or AI translators. So there's really a way a bigger diversity of roles there. It also kind of really depends a little bit on what you want to focus, be it on the 
more technical side, on the um, uh, soft side, etc. All right, I think that's really a uh, really sound advice. Um, We'll, we'll move into the part where we talk a bit about your current job, which is uh, what came after your, your job as cert. Yes. Um, but uh, for the uh, audience that is here, uh, feel free to ask all of your questions for Violetta, maybe about the, uh, the job search uh, or, or about her current position at uh, mm -hmm. ABN. Um, what is it you're currently working on within ABN, the Dutch bank? Yeah, um, so of course I can't share um, too many details, uh, but uh, I can give you an idea on how, in general, how my team works. Um, so I'm uh, fortunate that I'm in a team which has a little bit of a central position or a central role within the bank. And um, as such, we don't serve only one business line per se. Let's say you work for private banking only, or you work for retail banking or commercial banking. But we work, we serve various business lines whenever, for instance, they need help with resources uh, or whenever they don't have uh, the capabilities with their own departments. Um, so in, in a way, we kind of work as um, internal consultants, uh, which is really, really nice because you get to see how the various um, um, parts of the bank function, you're not always doing the same thing, so it's never boring. And at the same time, we are also trying to have a little bit more of a um, kind of central role in unifying and making sure that we as a data science community in the bank are uh, working um, um, yeah, in, in a similar way. So we also recently started working on um, so-called capabilities, which are some bigger topics that we think uh, the data science community within the bank uh, should, uh, should focus on. I myself am very passionate about um, um, responsible machine learning overall. So this includes topics such as explainability of machine learning models, ensuring that our models are fair and unbiased, they're not discriminating towards certain um, subgroups of the population. So I am uh, fortunate that I can, um, uh, yeah, focus on uh, on that as well in um, uh, in my job. Plus, I have a couple of um, projects with uh, with um, some business lines as well. Perfect. I can imagine that you cannot share all the details, but it gives us an uh, idea. Um, I wanted to ask you about how you landed the this job, but first we have an mm -hmm. um, off topic question, which we haven't had sure. the whole session yet. So I do wanna uh, yeah. point it out. It's from Shivan. And um, the question is, I love Violetta's necklace. Which chemical <laughs> compound is it? And dopamine is mentioned or serotonin? Yeah, it's a ser uh, serotonin. Yes, it's the second guess, yeah. <laughs> Oh, great. Yes, it's well, a neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter of happiness. <laughs> oh, great. That is really lovely. Um, <laughs> ah, there's asking what's the price. Well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, my on topic question how did mm -hmm. you land this job and, and, and maybe your previous job as well? Yeah. Uh, well, this job actually, I was uh, headhunted for it. A uh, recruiter uh, contacted me, they found me on LinkedIn. Um, so another tip if I can share is that at least in the Netherlands, LinkedIn is quite popular. Uh, so keep your LinkedIn profiles up to date. Um, and yeah, I was approached. I had a conversation uh, with the recruiter about the job and then with the hiring manager. At first I was kind of skeptical, but after a couple of weeks, I went and continue the conversations. Uh, and then I just uh, follow the standard uh, application process, which is uh, working on the use case, doing a presentation for the rest of the team, et cetera. Uh, my first job was uh, a bit more difficult. Uh, there, I was definitely not headhunted. I had to always be the one to uh, send applications. I, I do not keep track of how many applications I sent and how many rejections I got. But from uh, some of the disappointments and rejections that I uh, had before that I shared, you can imagine that uh, uh, there were, um, yeah, a few dozen. 
so yeah, for this, uh, as I also said, uh, for the first job, it's it just takes a little bit of luck and a little bit of uh, patience and persistence. And the first job that you land might not be, uh, yeah, your dream job, not the job that you see yourself doing in the next five years, but just stick with it for a couple of years because it will be for sure a very valuable learning experience. And it will help you get to the second job, which might be, might be your dream job. Great, I think that's really good advice. Um, and I think a follow-up question on this that we got from the audience is, would you in general recommend uh, using a recruitment agency to, uh, to find a job? Um, yes, I, I would, uh, I would, because uh, it really um, helps in a sense, um, well, not, um, not all, let's say, offers, job offers are on LinkedIn or on other portals. And it also saves you a little bit of effort of checking on all various jobs posting sites and uh, on LinkedIn, etc. And also when you work with recruiting agencies, uh, let's say there is a posting for, for a job and there is a recruiting agency helping to hire someone versus an applicant on their own. Sometimes those that are kind of filtered with the recruiting agencies might get a priority because they act a little bit like as a first filter uh, to the number of candidates. But there is unfortunately a lot of, um, um, yeah, a quite a large number of recruiting agencies uh, so there's also quite a bit of difference in, um, uh, in the quality there, which is something that you need to, um, yeah, uh, you need to just try out and see for yourself, which, which is the best fit for you. Yes, I think so. I think it's, it's in general good to go for specialized uh, uh, companies for, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, so what is for you, um, you're working at, at ABM, which is a, a large bank and a large corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, what is for you the biggest challenge in working in that kind of environment? Right. Um, well, so it's um, working in such a big corporation is not for everyone, I think. Um, it can be, uh, okay, so first of all, I expected it to be a little bit um, too formal, uh, too corporate, expect everyone to, I don't know, wear suits uh, at, at the office, but fortunately, it's, it's not like that. It is very informal, uh, but uh, one downside of working at such an organization, it's such a big company overall, is that it's difficult to keep track of what's going on. Uh, so it's difficult to stay connected with the relevant stakeholders, with the various communities of data scientists and engineers. So, um, it's, well, now it's less of a problem because we have uh, done things to improve that, but at least um, a few years ago, it could be the case that um, you start working on something, but maybe a couple of years before, before someone else in the same department or in a different department might have tried already to solve that problem, uh, but they fa faced certain challenges. And things would, uh, back then at least, not be always documented or people might have left the company. So uh, there was a little bit lost in translation. So in general, uh, with a big, a big company, the biggest challenge is just making your way around learning who are the relevant stakeholders, the relevant parties, and just staying connected, uh, staying informed, and just trying to connect all the dots. Yeah, I think, and that's true for a lot of large corporations, I would say, yeah. uh, right? Yeah. Um, all right. Um, what, what do you like most about your, uh, your job? Yeah, there are quite a few things that I do like. Um, so, as I, as I mentioned, the fact that we get to work with uh, different business lines so that you're not always kind of, well, not always solving the same problem, but uh, you're not working within the same domain. Uh, so, for instance, currently I am working with, uh, besides um, the other initiatives, I'm working with private banking, I'm working with uh, um, our uh, sort of internal economic research group among other things. And I do like the, this diversity. I do like um, the choice that we have of projects. I do like the fact that we have freedom 
uh, we are encouraged and um, have basically the opportunity to propose uh, topics that are important for us and um, that uh, we might think are important for the bank. So as I mentioned, I am very passionate about responsible machine learning overall. So that's something that I proposed to my manager. Um, and uh, then I found uh, colleagues who are also passionate about the same thing. And we have a couple of working groups that focus on uh, those topics. And we try to uh, yeah, develop basically processes and principles um, that the whole bank would follow on, um, on those topics. Yeah, I can imagine that's really cool that there's really place for initiative. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that definitely. is appreciated, yeah. And so what, what is, um, you think, one of the most important skills for a data scientist to work at, to do well at EDM? Well, I think that this is not something that would be uh, explicitly um, relevant for ABN, but in general, um, if I think about my previous job um, and other companies that I have observed, of course, it's difficult to say the most important. I was, I'll mention a few things. Um, so, of course, it's important to have a technical, solid technical foundation. So, no one will know everything. Um, it's difficult to um, keep up to date with all the new uh, and latest algorithms that, uh, that come out uh, with um, the newest uh, yeah, programming um, packages, etc. cetera. Um, but you should have a, a good foundation, at least in, uh, from technical perspective, because it's much easier to pick up what you don't know already. But it's not only about the technical skills. It's also very important to have, um, uh, as I also mentioned, uh, soft skills. So uh, being a good communicator, it's really important to be able to explain, uh, especially to non-technical uh, stakeholders, um, what your solution is like, how it works, um, how it fails, etc. Because if you can't explain it to them, if they don't trust it, they will never use it. So basically you went through all the trouble of building something kind of for nothing. Um, and it's also really important to be very curious um, to, um, and to be, um, yeah, to stay motivated because very often you might, it's, it's a little bit, um, sometimes working on a data science project reminds me about uh, doing my research back in academia because you have an idea of uh, how to solve a problem, then you try it, it might not work out, then you need to go back to the drawing board and come up with, uh, uh, with new approaches that you might want to try out. So it's really important to not give up, to be persistent, uh, but also to be kind of realistic and pragmatic. Uh, I see very often, um, mostly junior data scientists, they're very excited to try uh, the latest state of the art, most complex and sophisticated model. Um, whereas you can just start simple, see if it works, very often it does, and uh, try to improve upon that incrementally. So yeah, there is not really one, one skill that's most important, I would say, but it's just the plethora of skills that make a good data scientist. I'll quickly step in here because I think Chrisella is having a slight issue with her uh, internet connection. Um, just yes. following up on some of the questions from the chat and thanks everyone for interacting so much and staying with us today. It's really, really great to see the interaction. Um, so there's a few questions also about the, the timeline and how long it might take, especially when you're switching careers. Mm -hmm. Of course, you also had um, the PhD before you got started. So do you think at, for example, the age of 36, would you be too late to start or how long should you plan out if you're making a career switch? Oh, that's a, that's a good question and uh, also a bit difficult to, uh, to answer very concretely. So first of all, let me say that it's never too late. Uh, and uh, if, um, if you want to go uh, to data science, then uh, yeah, by all means, please do so. And um, yeah, how long would the switch would be? It really depends on what you have been doing so far, what your experience is, 
and uh, what exactly you want to do. Because uh, yeah, there is a lot of diversity also within uh, data science itself. It really varies what you might need to do from company to company. Uh, it also might be that you could do that switch within your own organization, with your own company. So that's something that you might want to uh, look out for. Uh, so um, for at least for me, I think that it took me around six months to make a transition um, from my PhD to data science. So I was completing my PhD and I was taking, uh, at least back then there were not that many, uh, let's say online courses and programs. I took the first Coursera uh, data science specialization and it took me about six months to complete. So uh, it really depends on yeah what skills and experience you currently have, and uh, but I expect that it would take yeah from six months to and this was six months of only uh, or mostly data science slash coding skills right if you want to go into I don't know taking some boot camps into the soft skills part as well that also takes some time. Thank you. Well, thanks for taking over, Lara. I did. I don't know why, but I was kicked out for a second. Um, <laughs> thank you, Violetta. Uh, one last advice for people who would like to uh, kick off their career in in banking. You want to give to the audience? Um, I think that it doesn't apply only to banking, but to any other industry. Uh, well, uh, especially if you are just starting, if if you're looking for your first job in data science, do not give up. It might be a bit difficult especially in the current market and the corona crisis, etc. Do not give up, um, just be persistent. And uh, yeah, the journey is worth it. Thank you so much. That's a very hopeful message to, uh, to end your part with. Uh, thank you for both the insights about your, the journey you've gone through and uh, about where you uh, are at now. Um, My pleasure. If any if any of you would like to know uh, more or hear more from Violetta, uh, do get in touch with, uh, with the European Leadership University as she's one of uh, our facilitators in the course. Uh, very happy to have her. Um, we're almost coming to the end of uh, the first day of our virtual uh, summit. Um, very exciting to hear all the different perspectives. And the last one um, is definitely not the least um, because we're talking to Martijn, who is an entrepreneur within the data science field, uh, which is something that we haven't talked about that much yet. Um, but of course, that is also an option. There's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in the data science market, I would say. Um, and I think Martijn can tell you everything about his journey. So welcome, Martijn. Please introduce yourself and uh, take the floor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, shall I uh, share my screen for the presentation? I, I yes, please do. All right. Uh, one second. Okay, see the presentation now? Yes. All right, perfect. All right, so uh, yeah, thanks everybody for uh, coming. Um, so just a little bit on uh, where I come from. Um, so I'm Martijn Nanne. Uh, I have a master's in data science. It's already a couple of years ago. And uh, I have about five years of data science experience and uh, a lot more of coding experience. And um, I first worked at a startup and then I started doing uh, freelance work and um, recently also started my own startup uh, and over the last few years, I've worked in uh, uh, in at least six startups um, in, in, in usually very early stage. Um, so that's quite different, I think, uh, from, from a couple of the other speakers. So that uh, might be interesting to some of you uh, that want to learn more about this uh, and about uh, the challenges in startups and also how it's different. Um, yeah, and I recently started a new product uh, focused on e-commerce companies to apply data science to uh, optimize marketing campaigns there. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show you guys uh, is the data science hierarchy of needs. Uh, I'm not sure if, if, if you guys are familiar with, but 
it's uh, it's very relevant if you are going to work in a startup. Um, I think the big difference between working in a startup and working in uh, in an established company, and you are going to work in a field of data science, is that a startup usually still has the challenge of uh, the lower stages of the hierarchy of needs. Um, of course, uh, larger companies can can also have this issue, but usually they already have a whole bunch of data that they don't know anything or they don't know what to do with it. However, if you are a data science startup, you might have an idea of, for example, how you can push a certain optimization uh, or, or you might want to solve a problem with, uh, with machine learning. However, you still have to collect your data first before you can do anything uh, interesting with it. Uh, and also, uh, if you are a startup, you need to um, create value relatively fast. So you might not have one, two, three years uh, to build up this huge project uh, and then have a, have a success in the end. Uh, you preferably want to create value uh, as fast as possible and then make it more and more intelligent and complex over time. Um, yeah, so, so we need to solve this, uh, this data collection issue and fancy AI is usually the, big, the last step. So as a startup, you might have this wonderful vision of like, okay, well in five, 10 years, we want to have this extremely intelligent uh, system. However, on the short term, um, we still need a use case that we can solve fast. And in my experience, this use case uh, usually depends on first solving the data collection issue. So where are we going to get some data from? And then making this, uh, this data uh, insightful. Uh, so that might not be as interesting as you hope as a data scientist, because you always want to apply machine learning and reinforcement learning. Uh, however, a little bit of business intelligence and uh, creating insights from that uh, is usually the first step uh, in a startup. Um, of course, I'm generalizing a little bit uh, and every startup is different, but in my experience, this is uh, usually the case. Um, so just a few, a few ways of how we can start collecting data uh, when we are building a new company. Um, so one thing is public data. Uh, I've also worked uh, in a startup that was um, uh, do predictive maintenance for roads. And in this case, we had a lot of public data. So there's a lot of public data, data available from the government. Uh, also weather data because the weather has influence on the road, uh, on, on the, the roads on the, uh, uh, where, where we drive, right? Um, so we had a lot of public data from the government, which is fairly standardized. Um, and we had weather data and we also tried to uh, incorporate satellite data, which is, uh, is, is also semi-public. Uh, so that's kind of the second point where we can get data from sort of set standardized systems. So a satellite provider, uh, uh, you can either buy or you, uh, and in the European Union, you can get access to satellite data uh, for free. Um, but the main point is that um, at least it's, it's in some way, it's standardized data that you can access. The third one, uh, so I've also worked in uh, two startups that were generating their own data. So for example, you have to first create an app that's useful to users, which in turn starts to generate data. Um, so for example, uh, I've worked at a healthcare uh, or yeah, so, some, some health tech startup where they wanted to uh, predict how people would feel after taking a medicine uh, based on their behavior. So they created an app that can monitor their uh, behavior. Uh, and then that was starting to generate their data set. 
So you have a startup that has this big vision of, hey, we might want, we want to, uh, we want to create, uh, we want to use data science in order to, um, to improve the drug testing process uh, by monitoring somebody's health. Uh, but then the first step is actually to create this app that can generate data. So it's not like we start off with this, uh, with this awesome data set. Uh, and we can start applying data science. Um, so the uh, fourth one is to that users do actually have data, uh, but it might be a little bit different between every user, uh, between every uh, customer that you have. Uh, but you can you can kind of force a specific format that they, they have they then have to upload. And that will enable you to uh, to get going with your uh, data data product. And the last one, uh, which is a lot more tedious, is that you have custom integrations. Uh, so, for example, um, I know a startup that does uh, medical imaging uh, diagnosis, and they will have to work with a hospital, and then uh, this hospital has to well basically provide them. Uh, automatically with uh, these images and these images are in business systems. So you have to somehow integrate with their uh, internal business system, um, which might be quite tedious uh, to integrate with, uh, uh, with specific uh, business systems. So yeah, the general rule is that we always want to try to minimize integration. Uh, however, as a startup, you might not be uh, well, you have to compromise somehow. And then, uh, for example, what we are doing now, we can uh, integrate with uh, standardized systems uh, like uh, Google Analytics or Google AdWords, uh, where we can easily pull data from. But we also have to uh, get access to transaction data, which is uh, a little bit harder uh, to get access to. So that's currently still a little bit of a custom integration that we want to automate in the future. So there's all these trade-offs uh, in an early stage startup um, or an early stage data startup uh, that we, you have to kind of be creative on how you can access data easily. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's usually messy. Uh, I guess uh, everybody in the data field can uh, can uh, can uh, relate to that, that when you get data from a company, 80% um, of the work is always in the data cleaning, the data integration, and uh, and just getting your data right just before, uh, before you can actually start to visualize it or uh, you can start to apply uh, to predict uh, the thing you want to predict. Um, and one thing uh, when you are integrate or when, when you want to work with different customers uh, uh, or different businesses is that you can uh, start to standardize the process. So you, uh, what we are doing currently is that we are telling our customers, hey, uh, we want our, uh, we want, we, we want you to apply to, uh, provide your transaction data in this specific format uh, with these columns uh, because everybody kind of have, has the same data, but they might just have different columns or uh, just a slightly different formatting. And it's that over time you try to uh, standardize uh, the data input more and more. Um, but yeah, the, the, the ways of inter data integration is, uh, <laughs> is uh, are quite different. So the, the ideal world is that with a button click, you can start pulling in data, which is the case for data analytics. But sometimes you have to force a format and you provide APIs that they can talk to. And sometimes we have to do custom integrations. All right, so uh, just a little bit of an example of how uh, my most recent project has started. Uh, I think it's quite interesting. It's basically from scratch we we started this. So 
we had this idea uh, based on our backgrounds is that we uh, know that we can we can um, optimize marketing campaigns better for e-commerce companies and well you can uh, you can basically optimize budgets from one campaign to the other one uh, so maybe one campaign is more profitable than the other one so it should get more budget than the other one uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. and eventually you want to find this optimum in how you split your budgets over uh, different marketing campaigns and you want to uh, predict this and you want to make this as optimal as possible. Uh, so that's kind of the big vision to have this self-learning algorithm that will optimize their uh, their marketing campaigns and maybe also other things. So if we look at the data sources, we have Google Ads, we have Google Analytics, uh, we have payment uh, transactions, uh, we get uh, the margins of all the products, we get the whole product lists every day. Um, yeah, and there's also a few more uh, data sources. And these are on different levels. So the standardized data sources are Google Analytics and AdWords. We can just simply pull them in. Uh, a standardized format is this transaction feed. Um, and a custom integration right now is, for example, the discounts uh, on products, which are going to be different between each customer. Um, so this was the first thing of like, okay, which data source are we going to use? And it's also has been a little bit of a process of, Hey, uh, what is actually available? And, uh, it turned out that e-commerce, uh, companies have, uh, already made these kind of transaction feeds, uh, and, oh, okay. Uh, and, um, and can provide this quite easily. So the process is that the first use case was just to make this data insightful. The, the, second, uh, the second step will be to optimize this based on heuristics. And then this third step eventually will be to create an optimization algorithm. Um, so we have to keep it really simple to, uh, to be able to create value quite fast. I'm going to be speeding a little bit uh, so, that, so people will have time for some questions. Uh, this is going to be the last slide. So, um, all right. So, so from my experience, the difference between working in startups uh, versus in big companies, um, I would say you, typically in a startup, you will have a little bit more responsibility and a wider set of tasks. So I've always been in charge of creating both uh, the data pipelines up until the machine learning, up until deployment of uh, this software. Whereas in a larger company, you might only be responsible for a part of that. Um, so if you enjoy working on a whole bunch of different things uh, in a fast paced environment, I you typically see that more in, in startups. It's also easier to bring in new ideas because you can just simply it's such a small environment. You can just talk to the CEO and, uh, and you can bring up ideas. Uh, that's, that's something I always enjoyed a lot. Uh, and you typically work with newer technologies. Um, however, in larger companies, um, you know, you can do more specialized work. You can work uh, on your very specific uh, research field, uh, which could be really cool. Um, there's a lot more money to, to, to spend on, on big projects. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot to learn in, in larger companies as well. Um, so it's, it's really a choice, uh, what you prefer and, uh, you have to test it out. All right. Thank you. Then I think we have a few more minutes for some questions. Uh, I hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you, Martijn, and uh, thank you for making the time for some uh, audience questions. Um, I think a question that we all have is, um, well, you being an entrepreneur in this field, it's uh, being an entrepreneur is always risky, right? It's more risky than a, than a, um, a set job, a permanent job. Uh, how, how do you deal with that? And why did you become an entrepreneur? Um, 
Well, I, I think I've become an entrepreneur mainly because uh, I feel like it's more exciting. Um, I, I just get a little bored if there is not uh, a lot a lot going on for some reason uh, in my work. Uh, and also really because I can basically be creative and think of new ideas and immediately execute them. Um, well, dealing with the risk. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely deliberately um, uh, set up a, uh, a financial buffer uh, so I don't have to worry for, let's say I, I don't get any money in. So for example, now we don't have a, a lot of revenue yet. yet so most of, uh, yeah, personal expenses are, are on our own uh, expense. Um, so you wouldn't start as an entrepreneur, but first make sure that you have like um, a, a buffer to to work with. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Also, from people I know, most uh, try to to at least have a year or something in as a financial buffer. Uh, but the good thing about entrepreneurship in um, in software startups in general is that they're very uh, low cost in general. Um, so you, you can uh, definitely until, for example, in the, until the first investment rounds or until you have your first customers, um, you know, server costs are quite low. You don't have to uh, invest a lot of money in physical goods or anything like that. So that's... Uh, I feel like it's still a fairly low risk uh, yeah. business. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense. Um, and something else, a question we got earlier today is, um, do you have any um, advice for people who would like to land a job at a startup? Um, especially yeah, now during COVID, it might be, it might be uh, more difficult, but uh, how do you do that? Yes. Um, well, there's a, there's a couple of ways I've figured out over the years. Uh, definitely one place to look at is uh, AngelList. Uh, or it's angellist.com or angel.co. Uh, then there you can start to look for startup jobs in the Netherlands. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then you also have uh, Deal Room. Uh, it's a Dutch, uh, it's also a Dutch startup that makes that site. Uh, and there you can filter quite heavily on, um, yeah, also on the type of startup. So even like, hey, I want to work in a startup uh, focused on healthcare, for example, uh, or, uh, or on a B2C or a B2B business. Um, and then I, yeah, in the past, both on AngelList and DealRoom, I just go through the list. I look at startups that look interesting. Then I look on the website. I can see, hey, are they looking for uh, for data science or data engineer? And then uh, you either apply through the website. But what I can also recommend, if they do not have any jobs on the um, um, if they do not have any jobs on the website. Uh, you can also look up the CTO on, uh, on LinkedIn, for example, which you can usually find and you can just say, Hey, I think the startup is really cool. Uh, do you want to have a chat sometime? And this is something you can do with a big company, just reach out to the CTO. But if the company is only like five, 10, 20 people, uh, they actually really, really like to you know, that somebody reaches out. And uh, in my experience, it has been a, a very good way of uh, introducing yourself. Yeah, I think that's really good advice because you think that everyone does that, right? But that's just not the case. A lot of people people don't. So that's uh, uh, good advice. Uh, in the chat, we got the question, what was the name of the second website? Was it, oh, somebody posted it. Was it dealroom.co? Room, uh, it's either dealroom.co or dealroom.com, yeah. I think uh, Robert just posted it, which is great. Um, one last question from the audience before we finish. Um, did you have um, experience in uh, large companies before and, and um, was the switch to startup and entrepreneurial personally? Um, 
Um, Did you put the comparison table? People are wondering. Well, yeah, so I, I have I have uh, worked for uh, well, I wasn't really working. So at the end of my uh, my studies, I, I I've been at uh, Booking for six months, uh, Booking.com, and um, well, personally, after my studies, I. I was already getting really uh, into startups. So I started working at a 35 person company first, and then I went to early stage startups. Um, so what I personally, because I already knew that I one day wanted to start my own business, I figured I, I thought I could learn more in startups uh, as in the full stack engineering part. So if you're building your own your own product from scratch, you need uh, a wide range of skills. So you need to know how you can set up servers. You need to know how to uh, make a machine learning pipeline. You need to know some data engineering stuff. You might need to need, need know some web uh, some web development to build a product. Um, so that's why after booking, where I saw. Uh, that people were very, very specialized on data science. Uh, I thought, well, I'm not going to learn uh, the wide range of skills that I think I need uh, in order to succeed. Um, so that, that was my, my choice after I was at Booking for six months. Um, yeah, uh, so even though you didn't start as an entrepreneur, you always knew that that was where where you were heading and um, we get this question a lot like is it a good idea to start at a big company or at a startup and I think what you already just said it really depends on what you want to learn like do you want to uh, become a specialist or or just have a very diverse skill set and and what is the environment that suits you and I think you really showed that in your comparison table and in your presentation um, for which I would like to thank you very, very much, uh, Martijn. Um, very cool to hear uh, the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, if people would like to know more about that, go and follow uh, Martijn and his uh, journey with his company. It's probably not going to be the last uh, thing you uh, you started, I suppose. Um, I hope so not. thank you, Martijn. <laughs> All right, um, thank you too. Yes, if you could That's stop uh, screen sharing, uh, I'll, uh, I'll end okay, cool. uh, this session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh. That concludes the day one of our uh, uh, virtual summit. Um, it was such an exciting day for, uh, for all of us. We've been looking forward to, uh, to it for a long time. And I want to thank everyone in the audience for, uh, for being with us today. Uh, we had a great interaction, uh, a lot of questions in the Q&A. I hope most of them were answered um, and um, a lot of good advice in the chat um, that can help all of you with your, choosing your data science career. Uh, big thanks to all of the speakers, to uh, Lara and Zina, who are here for community and tech support. Um, and of course, to the European Leadership University and AI agents for, uh, for organizing. Um, I would like uh, to tell you that for more information on interesting events and um, on, for example, uh, vacancies, please visit AIGENS as Robert had posted in the chat. And if you are looking for a master's program in data science that uh, focus on uh, practical skills, on soft skills as well, and that has a traineeship, so really the, the practical side um, and the business side, uh, please look at ELU, um, European Leadership University for uh, a relevant program. Um, Last but not least, we'll have a second day tomorrow. Uh, I won't be there uh, to host it, but Robert will uh, gladly take over tomorrow uh, from me. And um, we hope to see you all there again. Um, we'll talk more about landing your dream job in data science. Uh, we'll have great speakers from consultancy. We'll have a student who speaks about what it is to be a student. We'll, you'll hear more about what people are looking at in the CV. Um, so really hope to see you all again uh, tomorrow and thank you all for being here.